All right, everybody, it turns out we were right again. A high protein diet is superior to a simple calorie restricted diet. New study shows high protein diet kicks its ass. Whew. Is this really a new study? Yeah. yeah. Let me read to you some of the some of the stuff that came out of this. So they compared uh, a high protein diet to a diet that was um, just low, just calorie restricted. Okay. After a sixty day intervention with one hundred and thirty five obese people, so they took one hundred thirty five people overweight uh, to the point of being obese. They the high protein diet improved weight, lipids, and blood glucose more than intermittent fasting or calorie restriction. So it actually was better than all those things. Isn't that weird? I, yeah. I it's can see weird. that from blood glucose for sure. Yeah, well, no. I mean, look, the, the debate has always been or has been for a long time, hey, it's, uh, you know, as long as the calories are restricted or low and they're getting adequate protein, doesn't make a big difference. Of course, those of us in the fitness space are saying, no, high protein makes a difference. It probably burns more body fat. It definitely builds more muscle. We know that. Yeah. But now they're showing this in a, you know, now a, a, a peer-reviewed study. It's also better for blood lipids. Well, this also proves our hypothesis that we came to years ago with coaching clients, which was the idea that, okay, I have a weight loss client, obese client. Um, instead of putting them on a calorie-restricted diet or say, follow this plan, I'm actually going to focus on them going and getting more protein. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not going to tell them can't have this, can't do that. Just All I'm going to say is, it. hey, notice that you eat about 80 to 90 grams of protein every day. I want you to target 150 to 170. That's our goal. Mm -hmm. Don't mm -hmm. worry about anything else. Just focus on that, track that. And inevitably, what ended up happening? Mm -hmm. The client ended up losing weight because what we knew happened would, or would happen is they would replace the other bad choices with a, a more calorie dense food that's more satiating. In addition to that, it also promotes recovery for building muscle. And, and that indirectly way. burns body fat. Right. So yeah. it had this compounding effect and it was tremendously successful. Now this, I didn't have any studies to prove my theory, right? It was just through trial and error of, you know, constantly giving people diets to follow and seeing them, you know, inevitably fail at like a 90% rate over, you know, if it was over a year or whatever. And this is what I found worked so much the, better. The, the two main factors here, okay, that the data is showing, which we've also observed, which is what you're saying. The two main factors here is so why a high protein diet is more effective than just looking at your and cutting calories or just restricting your time, the time that you can eat, which would be fasting. The two main factors are one, Protein produces satiety. If you were to look at, if you were to consider all the things that make it hard for somebody to eat a diet or eat in a way that causes them to lose weight, at the top or near the top, I would say, is their appetite and cravings and hunger. Mm -hmm. Like, is it hard to eat fewer calories when you're not hungry? No, it's easy. No. Protein does that. High protein definitely it's does the that. Biggest challenge. Yes. I mean, so, I've noticed from any of my clients, it's really it's just like the cravings, the constant, you know, feeling of like having this this raging appetite if mm -hmm. if they're deprived from it. And to be able to solve that in a simple way with protein is is a perfect solution. Right. So to give an example, just to really nail this home, a lower calorie, higher protein diet will probably produce more satiety or reduce your appetite more than a higher calorie, lower protein diet. Mm -hmm. So you could eat, and I'm going to just make up numbers here. You could have someone eating 2,500 calories a day, but the protein isn't very high. Or somebody eating 2,000 calories a day, but the protein is high. And the 2,000 calorie person will feel more satiated. Feel more full. Yeah. Feel more full. And that is massive. So that's number one. And then number two, here's the other thing you talked about, which is high protein. This is, in, this is undisputable. Okay. This is like proven in study, study after study after study that a high protein diet contributes to muscle building. And if you're doing strength training and you're building muscle, you are increasing the amount of calorie burning machinery on your body. So you just give yourself a faster metabolism, which we've <clears throat> talked about many, many times on the show, um, is a better, more sustainable approach to fat loss. You wanna be able to eat more and lose more body fat, right? So high protein, wins. And this is another study that, that kind of proves that. I can't tell you how many times that I had a client that I put on a high protein diet after I assessed their eating habits and they came back and these are all uh, weight loss clients, fat loss clients, right? Clients that wanted to lose 20, 30, 40, 50 plus pounds. I can't tell you how many of them that after I 
put out a plan with a higher protein, uh, you know, strategy for them that they would report back. I can't eat this much. I know this is too much. Yes. Ironically, the person who that's the majority of people obviously was yeah. overeating calories for an extended period of time to have put on that much weight. Well, they would report back, this is too much food. I can't eat all this food. And so that would be part of the strategy. And I'd have to communicate to them. This has been for the coaches that are out there. You know, what happens with this client is they, they, they struggle with that. And so they, they miss protein targets. They miss calories for a couple of days in a row. And then all of a sudden they're, they're, they're really hungry and yeah. then they go make a bad choice. Yep. So when you're when you're dealing with a client like this is being able to communicate that like that's okay we'll work up to it you know we'll work up to getting that much protein and so like that but just be careful because if you continue to miss your protein targets and we continue to under eat calories two or three days are going to go by and then all of a sudden you're going to feel so hungry and then you're going to be tempted to go do you know the the behaviors or bad habits that you've done in the past of over consuming something that your body doesn't need you need to know that when that hits and that feeling comes on to go and eat one of those meals that I've taught you to go eat and then you'll feel fine. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just to give examples, like if I got a client that was trying to lose 50 pounds and they're like, yeah, it's tough for me to go on a diet because then I get hungry and I have a tough time dealing with that. And I look at their, what their typical diet looks like and they're eating like 60 grams of protein a day. I'm like, oh, you just wait. Like yeah. I'm going to have you eat 120 grams of protein a day uh -huh. and you're going to come back to me literally not exaggerating. 80% of the time, 80% of the time, if I had somebody that was eating that low protein and I had them bump it up to where I would consider high protein, at least 80% of the time, the person will come back to me and say exactly what you said. Yep. I can't eat this much. Oof. You know what a wonderful Full. thing? Yeah. Like imagine being that person trying to lose weight and you do this, what we're saying, and they're like, I can't eat this much. Like, is it easier now or harder now for you to lose weight? Right. It's right. a lot easier. Totally. So it's a very successful strategy. Now, along those lines, it's just a segue off that. The best sources of protein from a protein density standpoint, uh, protein availability standpoint. What I mean by protein density is uh, that you're going to eat something that's high protein that doesn't also come along with a lot of other stuff along with it, okay? Um, that's also, for most people, easily digestible and also nutrient dense um, is meat. Meat is at the top of the list. If you are going to go with a high protein um, diet to try to lose weight. You can definitely do this with non-meat sources. It's going to be exponentially more challenging. It's just much, much harder to do so. That's just the truth. So unless you're like a hardcore vegan for your own moral reasons, um, if you're flexible with this and you're you're like, I want to try this and I'm not vegan because I, you know, I, 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 it's not moral reasons. I just thought it was healthy or whatever. Go with meat. You'll find much more success because Working with clients who were vegan who also tried to go high protein, it was a struggle. Um, and we would only often only hit the high protein targets with protein supplements, which do provide some satiety, but a protein shake, it doesn't produce the same satiety as like a piece of chicken, a piece of meat, you know, a piece of steak or something like that. So I think the hardest part about that is is the being prepared, right? Like, so steak and chicken and fish and like these, these great sources of protein is having it available. So you make that good choice. This is where I like, I'm a, a, a big advocate for like meal prepping and, and, and getting it. Like I love have it like, ready. Yeah. Like we just got our, our butcher box came in yesterday and you know, that normally leads to this coming weekend, you know, because we just got this shipment, of all this meat is we will prep all of that and now I'll do you do the whole grill week it all one day yeah do you yeah. do the whole week over the weekend Mo yeah. yeah mostly so i do the whole week but it's basically about two meals a day for me if i Got have it. two prepped meals a day i can i can have my i can make my breakfast and i make my dinner so that's kind of like what it looks like oh for me. yeah so i have two meals that i'm going to eat at a tupperware and then i'm going to make my breakfast and I'm, the two I'm, meals that are most challenging right right in work. the middle of the day yeah, yeah in, in the middle of the day when i'm in a hurry i've got something prepped for that and that doesn't mean there is an exception to the rule where sometimes i have one of those prep meals for morning or for dinner or whatever like that but for the most part um, you know, I'm very consistent with having my oatmeal right now and for breakfast, the creatures of habit. And then at, at dinner time, Katrina always makes dinner 90% of the time. Yeah. So the prep meals is really the, you know, middle of the day. And then because, and let's be honest, it's, you know, noon, I actually just had one of my prepped, you know, meals right now. If that wasn't already prepped, I'm not making that choice. I don't have the time. I don't have the time to go make the steak, go make the, the potatoes and everything. It's not going to yeah. do that. So 
I'm a big fan of buying in bulk, you know, whether that's through Costco or a butcher box or something like that, and then preparing enough meals through the week that you have always a couple, you know, to have access to in the refrigerator. Yeah. So our go-to, um, especially when I have my older kids, because then there's, you know, there's four kids plus two adults, is uh, the tri-tips from ButcherBox. So I'll get the tri-tips first off because they taste good. Um, they're, e- they're easy to prepare. I literally sear them in the cast iron, put the whole thing with the, and I season them, but what, what, you know, I'll do rosemary, salt, uh, garlic, olive oil. And then, you know, after I sear them, I put them in the oven and we'll do like three or four of these tri-tips and um, I'll cook them in the oven, take them out. We'll eat dinner. And then I have like three days worth of tri-tip meat that I can eat for like two meals yeah. uh, that I'll have uh, during the day, but they have, you know, lots of choices, but I agree with you. I think that's the hardest part because um, you know, processed meat isn't really an option, I guess. <laughs> so, well, and what's your, so I'm going to say something that's some somewhat controversial because obviously we, we work with, uh, uh, companies that supply protein powders, but I would say of the protein sources, that's one of the, uh, least favorable options for you. Of course. And, and this is a, this is always a, a, a talking point for me when I'm coaching a client because, um, we, because protein shakes and bars are marketed so heavily, they're marketed as health foods and it's easy, you know, to get 20 or 40 grams that way. Uh, and so people tend to lean on that. I tend to coach that is an emergency use only. I do. I like what you say, where you tell people to, at the end of the day, I miss my protein targets. Let me throw a shake in there to hit my, hit, yes. my, hit my target. And I, and I find that I've had way more success yep with clients that are that, that they're going after their protein targets through whole foods through trying through through meats primarily to hit their protein intake and then only if you know they're you know way under at the end of the day they utilize something like that that to to make sure they still hit their intake and or like a weird situation you're flying I was just flying to Austin Texas which between airport time and flight you're talking about like 6 hours of, you know, driving, flying stuff like, and I'm in a pinch where I, I'm not, you know, right. I have a microwave around me and I'm stuff like that. So it makes sense. Now, many times I'll choose to fast, but if I'm like, I got to eat something like that's a, a, a place where you're not going to have your, you're not gonna have a piece of steak in your luggage. Right. Right. So it makes sense <laughs> to me to now. have those yeah. type of choices. But I am, but when I, when I evaluate or, uh, you know, judge my own diet, I, I don't consider a protein shake or bar day what I would call a perfect day of eating. A perfect no. day of eating for me is hitting macro targets through 100% whole foods that I made. Totally, yeah. 100%. All right, today's giveaway, MAPS Anabolic Advanced. If you're interested in winning this, here's how you can enter to win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we post it here on YouTube. Also, subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. Also, we're running a program sale right now. MAPS Anabolic and MAPS Split, both 50% off, huge discounts. If you are interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Uh, speaking of meat, do you guys know that Italy, I think, is the first country to ban lab-grown meat? Oh, they banned it. Wow. They also did a couple other things. Good for them. They also put up some mm -hmm. laws uh, for GMOs, I think, and stuff like that. But they banned, they passed a law. Maybe Doug can look this up. Well, aren't they the, the, the like, they're the one place where a lot of people who have, like, a, a gluten intolerance here in the States, and then they'll go over to, like, Italy. I've heard it. that, yeah. And then they can have pasta, or they can have bread, or they yeah. have certain things like that. Is totally that why so? different some? sort of effect. That's speculation. They have different, do they have different regulations yeah, on what? the speculation is that there, is that the 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 wheat there is not desiccated. Desiccated, like with, sprayed again later, With glyphosates, right? yeah. Because yeah, um, glyphosates are spread on wheat to dry them out. So it was called desiccation. And Italy, so here's the deal, Okay. Italy, and my family's from there, so I can say this. They are food snobs, hardcore. Like, they have a culture around food. Uh, they have cultures around certain things. Um, well, that's what, they did. that's what that article even says right there. Doug pulled up an article, and it's like, it moves to ban lab-grown to protect the food heritage. Heritage. Right. So they're like this with cars, fashion, uh, and food. And you can throw wine in there. They're very, very like, this is our culture. 
So this wasn't passed <laughs> for like moral reasons. It was more yeah. like disgusting. We will not eat that food. <laughs> We're passing a Repulsive. law. Yeah. Yes, we will only eat real meat. I don't think this was passed yet. Okay. It's been They're proposed. It. Yes. Okay. So, but you know what's interesting about this laboratory meat? Have you guys <sighs> looked at how they make this? I mean, do? I've briefly seen a video and it, it did not look appetizing. They they take the cells. So the real meat, like cells that they'll grow, and then they'll 3D print yeah. a steak. And then they 3D print uh, the marbling and stuff in it. So it looks it. like it. So like if you bought like 10 steaks that were lab grown, they would all look identical. You know what I mean? With the same like like the Same marbling, fat patterns. Every identical. Yeah. So I guess my thing is, is like you, you said, it was like, Molecule, it was already cells from a steak, right? I, I mean, I think they, they're the stem nexus cells of it is, yeah, it's it's stem cell, it's something from an actual animal, yeah, that then they reproduce and they just 3D print and smash together. And yeah, like, like how is that technically not meat? Yeah, not meat. <laughs> I mean, it is meat, it's just lab grown, it's meat. shitty meat. Well, it's, yeah, but it really. It really addresses because I mean, if there's the South vegans the are going to get on board, well, there's that. different types of vegans, right? Yeah. So if you're the vegan that's all about protecting animals, this but you would eat meat if it wasn't killing an animal. You would eat this. All you right. Eat so this. okay, yeah. okay. So so basically, you could like graft off like a part of an animal that's alive. Yeah, and, and now replicate the cell. I don't think well, it's like that. I think no? it's even. I think it's even more like they t literally take stem cells. And, and then clone them in the yeah, and they clone, clone it, and that's it. Like nothing dies. So, so yeah, so you're not gonna have to kill animals okay. to keep doing this. So then somebody who is a vegan by that choice, not because they hate meat or they don't want to eat meat. Bro, you could literally 3D print meat to look like whatever you want. <clears throat> like, think so about this. Gross. Like you could make like a meat like, like a Twinkie meat? Yeah. Like you can make like <laughs> different shapes and sh <laughs> So here's how it works. Yeah. Scientists can harvest a small sample of cells from a living animal and cultivate the sample to grow outside the animal's body. They then shape the fully formed sample into cuts of meat. Fish fillets, burgers, and bacon produced in this way taste just as consumers would expect them to, but millions of animals don't need to be bred, confined, or slaughtered to create these real you know, meat You know what I think we products. should I, I think we should do huh. this. I'm pro this, and it okay. should get shipped to everybody who's starving. Like that is to me like that. That's better. Only than, if it's cheaper. I don't, maybe it might not be cheaper. Well, I think that's a problem. Well, it's not cheaper. It's not right now. Mm. It's more yeah. expensive. It's not? No. It couldn't be. Cause that's because of where we're at. Engineering that's got to be yeah. where we're at because we're yeah, at. We have to the very inception. Yeah, of it. it's like you know, early days of a computer and a cell phone. Give so, it ten, can, give it 10 years, yeah. and then it will be replicable. And then, and then, and then I'm pro that. Like, if it comes to yeah. somebody who cannot get any food or, and or like water, those places on the earth like that. Mm -hmm. So it says, cost for cell cultured meat need to come down quickly because most of us have limited appetite for $50 lab grown chicken nuggets. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So it will though. It will. This is a good, this is a good discussion because something yeah. inside of me and I can't point to it. Okay. Something inside of me is like, this is wrong. Yeah. But, but the logical side of me is like, we're not killing animals. Yeah. It's still meat. Right. right? It's I the same I, cells. I, I don't I don't think it's wrong. I think I think it's amazing. You don't feel something inside it you? No, no, no. It seems like it's in the right Hear me direction, out. Hear me but... out. I won't fucking touch it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. that's where I'm at though. Okay, like, okay I won't, that's I'm not touch okay, it. Okay, well listen though, but but listen, there how, what's the what percentage are still starving? I mean, we have a, a, a massive amount of people. Yeah, but it's not because we don't have enough I know food. it's because we can't I know because it's of shipping distribution, so, yeah. yeah, but you're going to be able to distribute this fake ass meat. I'm sure you're going to be able to store it <laughs> and we if we can't now, we will in the next decade. Yeah, Can we agree point. on that? Can we agree that? Yeah, if, but I don't know if it's the lab grown meat that'll solve that. I mean, we we have we have people that we have bums with cell phones now, bro. We do. Yeah, we do. So, <laughs> it, there's there, it's using that politically correct term. So, it's only a matter of time. <laughs> There's only a matter of time before we can ship this fake ass meat to people that need food. And that to me, I'm I'm pro that. Yeah. So I'm for that. Now you won't ever catch it in my house. 100 percent you won't catch it in yeah. my house. Yeah. So. Well, so here so here's you guys ready for this? I'm gonna blow your minds right now with the unintended <laughs> consequences of this potent of this technology. Let's just imagine a future where lab grown meat is uh way cheaper, way more accessible. It's taste obviously tastes just like meat because it is meat. How many cows do you think would survive and exist on Earth when we no longer need still a lot? Cows? Still a lot. Here's why: because there'll really? still be people like us. They're, here, petting zoos. Here's here's the deal. Not a lot. 
Not enough. Like, okay, let me put it this way. There's a reason why cows, pigs, well, chickens maybe just are the, so plentiful. Hey, maybe just to ride them out. Maybe they're going to be all in these free range type of grass fed type of farms instead of the way we do it commercially right now. Isn't it weird though? Like, so I mean, that, like, let's be honest. Maybe it goes to where it, like a much healthier way for it to be. We're a more sustainable place yeah. versus these massive commercial farms where we right. sure. We, well, we, that's always been the problem is just the pure volume of people that need to consume meat. Like it's, it's insane. So if you could kind of solve the majority, you know, the big problem with that, but then also yeah, have I mean, like the specialization how, a part of it, which you're saying with like uh, farms that how, are like ethically. But there's yeah, how, how great would it be if farmer, farmer markets become, like the high end, like connoisseur, high priced, like eating because people like us well, it want sucks for us. But we, 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 people, <laughs> uh, I know it does suck so for us in a sense, right? But I mean, yeah. it's all relative, right? It'll yeah, probably yeah, yeah. it'll be expensive compared to what you're saying because it'll get so we'll drive the cost down because we'll have AI creating the meat, we'll have robots that are shipping sure. it and doing it, so the cost will be so little. So then, if you really want Talk to take the risk of option. eating yeah. this this fake ass meat then you can and, and you can do it reasonably priced and we'll save a lot more lives like, that this, way this this meat's expensive because we killed it it was actually alive <laughs> <laughs> you know what though this is true slaughtered Wait, now, meat. listen that's okay though there's a lot of myths around around this though because ruminating animals like cows uh are, if you let them be grass-fed like okay so butcher box grass-fed meat when cows go and eat the grass, it's a. This is actually Plus healthy part of circle for the of life. It's part of circle life, but it's also important for the environment. Yes, it's important I mean. for carbon dioxide capture, yes. oxygen production. It's important for the land. Yeah. So we would actually solve maybe one problem, but we create three other problems that people don't realize. Why would, why would we create? Wait, wait. Because you need ruminating animals. You need them. That's for the why. Think, uh, yeah. I, so we'll just have them out there roaming. I guess. Yeah, why wouldn't you have- Who's going to take care of them when there's no market for them? You there will be a market. You still don't think people like us would go pay a premium price Not for- enough. Not yes, enough. you would. We do right now. That that yeah. That butcher butcher box is more expensive than if you were. I mean, it's, it's relatively not that much more. It's not much more. A, thank yeah. God. Yeah. But I, I think that's how it'll be. It, it will drive the other stuff really down hmm. because robots and AI and all that shit can take care of all of it. And then you'll have real raw milk. You'll have real farmers that are raising real cattle and having to slaughter them, and, and then it, it'll be a higher price. <laughs> They're like Rolex farmers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, bro. They're, they'll Rolex be like ball farmers. gold teeth. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, the new way to like it's flex, good, you know, right? Yeah. Yeah, we'll you know, rap He's videos. Got the <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? The farmers are all balling out of control. Ferrari tractor, yeah, just spinners oh, and shit like that. You know what I'm <laughs> <laughs> They're big ass dually. I kill my meat. <laughs> I don't know, man. Like I said, it'll 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 solve some problems. Create, but now here's another question: What other exotic meats that really aren't commercially available? Because it's just not. But I wonder what exotic meats they'll be able to create because they can grow it in a lab. Oh. You know what I'm saying? Like, like rare delicacies. Like we've created the most tasteful meat. We've combined alligator, steak, and chicken. And ostrich. In this, yeah. 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 Like they could create some weird shit. Did you guys watch, did any of you guys watch that movie, The Menu? I did. I, did. No, oh, well, I, I didn't loved watch it. I was going to watch that. that I loved was, it. It was different, huh? I loved it. Yeah, yeah, I liked it too. I thought it was really Katrina good. Katrina wasn't a big fan of it, but I really? liked it. Yeah, because she doesn't like, like she likes all oh. happy endings and all like that. I like I weird. it was cool. I like weird shit like yeah, that. I like that's twisted endings. Oh, yeah. dude! Speaking you of like murder, it. in in um, <laughs> this, this reminded me. Okay, <laughs> speaking of murder, executions. Nice right there. Okay, yeah, because we're talking about you know killing slaughtered cows. Yes. Okay, I got you. Uh, so I murdered I'm, my meat. I'm, yeah, oh, yeah, sorry, yeah I just murdered it outside. Um, <laughs> so you, you know, like the the method that in France for execution, like you know where the guillotine came from, right? Well, I don't know where it came from, but I know they used it. Okay, I mean, the so, French Revolution, right? Is that what yeah, it was like, a, like they did it to, specifically to kings that did something like that. Well, so it was to, to be more ethically. Oh yes. Oh, and so like I believe it was a surgeon that like invented it. Yeah, because they saw it hanging, right? Mm -hmm. I think I remember this. And like, this is not cool. This takes a long time. It's hurting. Yeah, it's torture. So, so they found a way to like more clean. How crazy is that? I think that that's like a, that was like the more ethical way. <laughs> so crazy point, right? that in fact, okay, do you guys? Okay, what's your guess for the last time it was used in a real execution in oh, France? Oh, in France? France? Yeah. Uh, uh, 1875. I bet you it was used in the 40 19th. years ago. I bet it was used no. in the 1900s. I'm going to guess 40 years ago. Okay. 1977. It Whoa! 1977? 1977. I'm pretty damn close. Isn't that crazy? What did you say? Uh, 40 years ago. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, Doug was on the money there. Yeah, right on the money. Dude. How did you... What, what, what made you guess? It seemed logical to me. I mean, what can wow. I say? 
<laughs> like they opt in for that, you know? Like, now, was it by choice? Like you're going to be executed? Because then that makes kind of sense. I right? think like, like, if I, like if I had a choice, like, oh, I'm going to get the gas chamber, I'm going to get the electric chamber, or I just chop my fucking head off. Yeah. Some people would probably go chop my head off. I don't even want to, you know? Some people choose like a firing squad or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> is that, is that how it was? Was it like a choice? I think so. Do you know that? That's did, wild. Did you know that? Uh, was it public too? No, oh, I don't. No, they don't do public shit. Yeah, nobody well, does that anymore. Yeah, Middle East know. will do that. They'll, they'll execute yeah, you publicly. Well, they'll put it on YouTube. But yeah, yeah. Did you, so did so did you know this? So if you read about like people getting their heads cut off, apparently your head gets cut off, and you're alive long enough. Yeah. To be to aware. See. Yeah. Like your head got no. cut off. No. Yeah, yeah. Like you could see your body and everything. Yeah. I've heard yeah. that. Until too. your brain starves from, from loss of la lack of blood. And then you. How, I mean, logically, that makes sense. But like, I, I mean, that's fucked how up. do you confirm that? You imagine that? like shrimp. Yeah. Who confirmed that? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I still feel it. Oh, he put his head back on real quick. <laughs> oh, no. They theorize it. Of course, they can't possibly. But yeah. you know, electrocutions. We theorize are, Electrocutions aren't any more freaking uh, humane. If you read about electrocution, no, is, isn't it? Isn't the uh, they fuck the, up? Isn't the shot is like the most like the injection? Yeah, the injection, yeah. right? Lethal injection, I think. Yeah, because they, I think they can mess that first. up too. Can it's, they? It's happened. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, they give you the wrong one first. Yeah, or they the is it similar to? Do they do the same thing the for humans that they do for like animals? Like when you put your dog down, is it the same type of like? Process? I know. I know they use like a couple different. Uh, I think yeah, one you puts use, you to sleep, when you, compound, yes, and then one kills in. you. When, yeah, when we had yeah. to put Mozzie down, it was like three different shots. I think one puts him yeah, to sleep. One, right, one not numbs him, like yeah. relaxes him. So and his he nerves calm it. down, so he's not like all yeah. freaked out. So the first one like totally relaxes him. Then one numbs him, and then the, the last one's like the... And I actually think that a lot of times, or one slows his heartbeat down slowly. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And a lot of times that one will make them go, and then they only use the third one if, if, they, it didn't? if he doesn't go. Oh, yeah, yeah. That sucks. I mean, it's sad, but it's actually for me it was a i mean we they actually i don't know if you knew i didn't know if you guys know this or not but they'll come to your house like so we had someone which was really yeah, that's, that's nice yeah we had a fire Option. going with the house we had like it, with the whole night we were spending with him before i mean it was sad right thinking back of it's very sad but i mean better than like taking him to some cold hospital oh, like yeah. when bentley died bentley died during covid so we couldn't katrina and i both couldn't even be there Ugh. So that was awful. What you know a saying? stupid yes. policy. It was, oh, so stupid. That was one of the ones that made me so angry. Oh, I was out of so all stupid. the things. That was the worst. Oh man. It yeah. Was, oh. So that like so dumb, right? So yeah. like that was Bro, we're gonna look back on that time and be like, what the hell were we thinking? What we did what did we did to all these people? Oh, you know, dude, there's God. still people driving around with masks on by themselves. Oh, I'm, not sure. I'm sure if we're gonna look back. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. I don't know what it is right now that when I go places and I see that and and I'm trying to come from a place especially of, now that the Cochrane review I, came bro out. I know I'm trying that to come, I try out. and come from a place of compassion of and course. love and Arthur Brooks I try and keep in my head like you know yeah. talking to me love everybody and be compassionate let's just say it's hard it is <laughs> it's dude. hard to do it is you know yeah. what I think it, like, where it bothers me is when I when I see children mm. around like their kids you know what I'm saying that like their kids are wearing them still and stuff like that and it's just like. Do you not have any idea yeah, of what scared. you're potentially? Bro. You know, you know how much communication is is nonverbal. Seventy percent. Yeah, it's eighty. It's like eighty something is percent is not that. is nonverbal, dude. And and a, and a, during a child's early years of development, like you're 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 taking away eighty percent of their ability. There's a reason why. You know, what teachers too. By the way, I've heard this now. Like, <clears throat> where were we at? We were at school or somewhere, and I heard multiple. Uh, moms and teachers talking about some of the kids and they refer to these kids as COVID kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's become so uh, like normal yep. to have these kids that speech are speech pattern problems, yeah, speech processing problems, can't process emotion as well. Yes. Uh, anxiety issues. I mm -hmm. mean, don't it, get me started. No, I mean, I get fired up when I, that's what it I'm saying. Really when mad, I dude. still see these people. Have that, you ever seen, have you guys ever seen, I know you're familiar because your wife was a nurse. Have you ever seen the training that, Hospital oh, experts that, have to that that like, health practitioners. My my have best to go friend's wife is a nurse, and she told yeah. me it's like a whole like certification. You yeah. to learn how to use a mask. Yeah. Otherwise, it's a waste of time. Yeah, is what yeah, they say. Yeah. Yes, and they're like, "Hey, you're a three year old. Put a mask." I mean, on to them. me, that's besides the point. I mean, the real point is that, like you said, is that the, all the research has come out now to like like it's no longer a question. Yeah, it's a waste it, of time. It is, and it's like why continue? And then and then now you have to be like 
Not only has it been proven that it's doing nothing, now what are you doing? No, it's not doing nothing. It's causing damage. Yeah, right. You're, now yeah. you're just doing damage. And, and then I guess I just get fired up when I see kids involved. Because if you want to be stupid and do it yourself, then whatever. I mean, we have plenty of stupid people that do a lot of other stupid things. Yeah. So I'm not going to get mad right. about that. Like, But when you got like a, a child in the car with you or your kid has got it on still too, and I'm just like, I told you, kids what at the my, fuck are you doing? Kids at my kid's school still wear them. And it's, it's, it's because, and you ask them, why are you still wearing this? Well, first off, they're self-conscious anyway at that age. So it's like, an, now, and they've had, they've worn it's a great way to hide. Years. It's yeah, they worn it for two years, so now you got to be the one to take it off first, and then second, it's because some of the fucking some of the teachers still yeah. still wear them, yeah. and it's so that's you know I don't know it's a weird it's a hard reversal. I have a lot of empathy. Did I ever tell you guys about the time? This reminded me of uh, you know talking about kids and parents and stuff. I went to Disney World years ago, and uh, so you Disney. Sco- you mean Scooterville? Yeah. So rascal town. Well, no, Crazy. hey, yeah. dude, have you guys been to Disney World? Oh, I've been to yeah one time, but uh, no, I haven't mainly been Disney Disneyland. Just Disneyland. So Disneyland, it's California, Disney World, yeah. Florida, and so I think because Disney World attracts a lot of the South, mm-hmm. they have a higher mm-hmm. obesity rate and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. And I remember when we got there, it was right around when Wall-E, the movie Wall-E, yeah. came out, yeah. and I remember traffic <clears throat> jams in Disney World with the scooters from people who were too obese to walk. Uh-huh. Like that's how many people were on scooters, and I'll never forget. You just reminded me. This woman who, I mean, and it made me really sad, right? She was probably 400 something, 500 pounds, like really, just really, really obese on a scooter. Her daughter was sitting on her lap on the scooter. Her daughter was also a very obese five-year-old and she had what looked like a bucket of soda and she was just drinking it and they were driving around Disney World. And I remember like, oh. My, you know, my older kids were so young and it like broke my heart. I was like, oh my God. That was a long long time ago, right? Long time ago. Yeah. I think you remember you first telling me that and it was, it was early on when we first had the podcast going. Yeah. And I actually took a picture. It used to be on my Instagram. I don't think it's on my Instagram anymore. A long time ago when we were at like some 7-Eleven and they were, they were selling. And I remember watching the evolution of this. You remember, I can remember 7-Eleven when we were kids. It went crazy for and, like the size. You know, so I, double we're, gulp we're, we're size, old enough dude. to remember before the big gulp. Like there, it used to just be small, medium, and large. You know and how it, big sodas were when Doug was a kid? Yeah. Bro, the, the I shot glass. To- yeah. <laughs> small as a shot glass. No, wait, 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 probably wait. ten or twelve ounces. Yeah, at the it most. was a little there, bottle. I've seen good. I've seen really good. Uh, you know, comparisons, what, right? Yeah, yeah. Of like the generations of yeah. like the even like a an order of a burger and fries and a drink and those things yeah. like that. Like, but I mean, I remember like Seven Eleven really stands out to me because as a kid. Yeah. So I, when I was in Same. high school, I used to go to Seven Eleven and have coffee before I worked the dairy. So I have this like vivid memory. And then when I came to San Jose, I had a 7-Eleven that was right by my house that I bought when I was 20, 21. That was right there. So for, and I lived there for eight years and I would go there all the time and I'd pick up like energy drinks and stuff. So I watched like the evolution of the drinks change. And I remember when we started this podcast, I'd gone in one, I'd been in one a long time and they had this one gallon like mm-hmm. he was like, I don't know what they called it. Oh, what is yeah, that? Yeah, it was though? a handle. Yeah, the original fountain drink at McDonald's was seven ounces, and that was in 1955. Seven ounces. Wow. Yeah, so they had the like double gulp, and then they had the super double gulp. And I remember this vividly because my brother and my dad were like addicted to cherry Coke. And, and they drink the whole thing. Dude, I swear, and I think, I don't know what uh, my rationale was, but I was just wasn't into soda. You know, I wouldn't really drink it much. I would have like, occasionally I have like a Sprite or like, but I was drinking water. It didn't go well with your cigarettes. Just did, yeah, <laughs> my cigarettes and my meth <laughs> was a bad combo. I can't imagine any of us smoking cigarettes. It's no. Just the, just oh, look, look weirdos. Well, I, I mean, it. I went through I a phase. Cigarettes. I, I, I tried for a year. Ugh. For a year. Yeah. You smoked cigarettes for a year, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, I did no, for one did. for one year. Wow. Not like religiously, though. It was like an yeah. after, like after work type of deal. Yeah, I did. I went through a, a phase like that. Do you see that 7-Eleven has 128 ounce? It's called the Team Goal. The team, yeah. <laughs> team goal. So, okay, what's up? And you know that that's thirteen hundred seventy nine yeah. calories. So if that's it's a, a Coca Cola. Right? Yeah, is that a half gallon for the that? team of uh, one? Boy, uh, this thing was a gallon that I saw. That's yeah. pretty close to a gallon. Hey, you sure. and your friend, hey, you and your five friends want to share one drink? Yeah, yeah. introducing the team goal. <laughs> Disgusting. <laughs> what the hell's going on here? Oh my god. I mean, you, you got to wonder how. I mean, how many? If they, if they, they sell it because they guess, make money that, off that's it. That's what I'm saying. If they sell it and make money off it, and they wouldn't do it if it wasn't selling. Mm-hmm. So how many people? Dude, I want to go back to you talking about smoking <laughs> cigarettes. Why did you smoke cigarettes for a year, bro? I can't imagine. I just picture Adam right here. Yeah, because I tried chewing tobacco. I was like trying to make it happen because oh, I was playing baseball and like all of my friends I mean, were like come on, making let's it be work. Honest, right? I couldn't make my, it work. 
My, I just picture you on your balcony. I mean, come after on. working at the that's gym, that's actually exactly what. That's exactly <laughs> what. That's exactly what it looked like. So actually. that drink is one gallon. It is what. So it oh, was okay. a gallon. So that's the all one right. I saw. All right. right. Jeez. So look, first of all, let's let's un unpack statistically what I was supposed to be, anyways. Right. I was supposed to be in prison, drug addict, you know, criminal, all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, with yeah, it, right. Yeah, so yeah, like, yeah. You know, so you, anything you, is a success. Not. It was only a year. Yeah. So yeah. One year. It wasn't heroin. Calm down. So I pretty much tried everything at one point you know what i'm saying so at one point i have tried damn near everything and you know i live with a good buddy of mine who i was really it was like my best friend uh mark baker he knew and yeah. he, he smoked uh -oh. and you know and it just like it probably has started for many people it was like who i i didn't ever smoke when i was younger it was like Oh, on the weekend when we were out partying or doing yeah. something like that, like, oh, I'll have one with you. And I got the head change from it. I was like, oh, I kind of like that. Yeah. And then that, then it turned into like, oh, well, on a stressful day of work, I'll have one afterwards. Yes. <laughs> At the gym. But you know what's funny? <laughs> you know what's funny? Is got one the, of his even the entire time, I was like embarrassed about it. Like, I don't think I had ever openly admitted or talked about it because I hated the way it made me. I would instantly, after I'd smoked it, go scrub my hands. Yeah. And I always kept alcohol oh, on me and stink of it, brush it, my teeth. It like, I did not shame. Yeah, I totally. It was. It was shame, embarrassed, and the and I chased crying the, in the shower. I just I chased the head high from it, right? Yeah, I, yeah. I liked the head change from it and stuff like that, and so I would justify it from a long stressful day after work and doing that. And he was having one, and so you know that's what happened. But I mean, it lasted about a year, and then I like had to come to Jesus cigarettes. Myself. The the anti cool campaign worked so effectively for cigarettes because they were so cool for a long time. Oh, they were in every movie too. Yeah, I mean every action hero. It was like smoking or I, I think the, what I gravitated more towards was the cigars because that was yeah. like your a team guy, or yeah, yeah. you know, it was always like some general. Just like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that guy. so are that. Guy. That's my guy right there. <laughs> so I, I got more into cigars. Hey, they say media. What do you think all your worst? Kids? What is everybody's worst habits that you think you've you, that you had that whether it was a short stint or a long stint, like as far as health wise, on, I anti health. I still shit. I still have issues with supplements. We don't need to go there. Yeah, I but still that's take not all kinds of weird. Yeah, shit. but that's not like anti health. Do you think? Have you seen the mix of shit I'll put together? No, sometimes? I do know. I mean, I would I would. You don't know all. All of it. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> you baby, I don't. Yeah, I get weird sometimes. Uh, it's real exotic it's ones. It's I, yeah, bags. I still yeah. got bad. I tell you what, hey, fitness saved my life. I swear to God. Doug, dude. what was your worst yeah. health? You're like the healthiest. So what's your worst? Yeah, I'm trying to remember. What is your worst like yeah, what stretch? Which some crazy shit right now. <laughs> yeah, Doug's grass. like, well, I went on this little heroin kick yeah. for about seven months. Wow. <laughs> I'm trying to recall. I mean, I, I did eat too much food. I mean, that was basically the challenge I had. You're such a pussy. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. You said you're a pussy. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was he's more like, of a retrobrate. Yeah. Retrobrate. I had a couple Whatever extra hundred calories he's for like a year. He's like, I used to eat candy sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that so was a good. Hey, you never go a through a drug phase? No. Never, you never dabble with drugs? No, food was my drug of mm. choice. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Justin, where was your, you would say your worst, your cigars? Was that Prostitutes, your worst? Prostitutes, heroin. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Stupid. Wow. Stupid. Yeah. Uh, I would say, I mean, I was a bartender, so I drank a lot. Oh, alcohol dude. for you. Oh, yeah. A alcohol lot. For you. And I mean, it's still like somewhat there, but it's not like anywhere near where I used to drink when I was in college. Like it was, I, I went, it was after I broke up my girlfriend, it was like, you know, this justified, Oh, I'm going to keep going out. And I just had this, like, it was probably a year of just like, I was like Self out every night, just destructive. Yes. Just very much like punishing myself with it. And, uh, between that and I guess, I mean, I was eating restaurant food all the time. So, but I, I would still like, I, I never really went like to, I tried because I live with a lot of fat guys yeah. and <laughs> they tried to take me to these like buffets and like, they it's just kind of a weird thing where they want you to be a fat guy too, you know? <laughs> and they're just like doing everything they could. To, no, like, misery loves company, right? And I was like, and, I, and at some point I was like kind of trying and I was like, you know, I was definitely fluffy, but like. It, I just couldn't go to that level. I was like, this is gross. Like, it just didn't resonate with me. Dude, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine the, the house you guys lived in together. Oh, it was awful. I couldn't bring anybody over, dude. Like, I just, I, I mean, because these guys were, hold on, they're not just like fat dudes. They were giant, giant, giant fat. Well, they were all linemen, right? Huge. Yeah. Linemen. Yeah. Like linemen, six, five, six, six seven, seven mm -hmm. just giants. 
Yeah, the, people thought like we could just were imagine like the Jack in the Box bags out. all over the place. Like, yes, like, like pizza Justin's boxes a, stacked up. Like Justin's a big dude, right? He's thick oh. cakes, right? He was the little guy, right? He's like the little yeah, guy. Yeah, I was a little, little guy. guy. <laughs> that was a little dude. So they the just go around, you know. <laughs> yeah, you guys should have seen. Okay, so both my my friends worked as um, uh, bouncers at the Cubby Bears. It was this like bar that. Uh, would bring in acts like and you'd have like all this. It sounds like a gay bar. It sounds like a gay bar. The cubby, cubby bear. <laughs> it does actually kind of sound like it was near Wrigley Beyond. Field, so it was you know the Cubs. But uh, I could see how you go ahead. Share that. your other additions yeah. with us. No, right. so the, <laughs> <laughs> this is not making sense. So you know, I went through like a little cubby bear face. <laughs> <laughs> they threw him around. Yeah. Oh my god, this makes sense. Uh, oh my god. All right, relax. I'm at your uh, win. All right, go back to your <laughs> side. Yeah. They, okay. <laughs> You That's set good. yourself up on that. Yeah, I did set myself up for that one. So they so they basically were there bouncing and, and they would get these parties upstairs that um I mean they had leftover food all over the place and like they're just shameless about it and they would just take it home and like from the party? From the party. They just if you know, and so there was I wanna say ten boxes of chicken wings. And I get home and I see one of my friends Ed on the couch. Literally, like his pants unbutton, his like shirts off, and he's eating like wings. And I see stacks of bones, like <laughs> all. It, it was the most disgusting thing I've ever seen <laughs> in my life. So, like, I couldn't get an erection for like two months after that. I was just like, <laughs> oh. I just want to take a shower immediately. <laughs> the farts. Well, that was so. Was that? I mean, that's that's another funny thing to think about. Is like your messiest like roommates where they were like the most disgusting roommates you oh, ever had. Yeah. I threw everything away. I did, like it, it got to the point where I was like washing dishes and then nobody was doing it. And <laughs> they were they were literally eating off of like Tupperware lids. Oh my god. Oh my god. And like I'm just picturing poor Jess that he's the smallest guy. I, I'm just like cleaning what? up after everybody. What is happening? I was yeah, I'm like vacuuming like cockroaches and, like, and rats. I, just, I and gave up. Like yeah. I, I be honest with you guys, I just gave up and I was like, forget it. And we got to the point where we were moving. And so like, we had it. flies it this big that were just like, and then they would give up. They like, <laughs> <laughs> the flies that gave up on life. It's like, they smacked it's it. So and it just, <laughs> it just died. Just squish. <laughs> obese fly. I was like, it, it didn't even try and get I've away from me. heard of that before. And then I just took yeah, all of these flies. dishes and I, and I just threw it. We were three stories up and I threw it over the balcony and then into a dumpster and we ju I just threw everybody's shit away. Now you never went through like a roommate experience really. No. Long. You I, never had roommates. I live huh? with my parents. Oh yeah. Well, you, did you ever go through roommates? Yeah, I've had a few. Yeah. Did you have like a crazy messy roommate? I did actually. So when I came back from uh, Japan, I needed a place to live and I knew this guy who worked for Microsoft. Uh huh. And so he goes, oh, I live in this house with five other, five other guys that work for Microsoft. It was this massive house and I got in there and uh, there was one open room and of course, all these guys were like totally into their tech and all that type of thing. And yeah. my next door neighbor, I walked next to his room. I could actually smell the room Ugh. as oh, I walked by it. Disgusting. I don't think he ever washed it. Oh, his, his sheets. I've heard like stories that. that oh, I've had I've had all kinds of bad. Well, situations. I've heard stories that uh, uh, from women when they live with all girls in sororities that they're filthy as hell too. It's not just dudes. I've heard stories of, of it's of a friends different of mine. kind of. Well, I mean, uh, it's a di it's, it's a different, different kind of level. Messy. But I've yeah, lived with gross. both. I had I had female roommates. I had male roommates. I mean, I had my house by the time I was twenty one. I always rented at least one, if not two, rooms. Mm. So I've had I've had one, two, three different girls that live with me. Really? One, two, three, four, five, like three six, company? six different. No, I did. I mean, over a course oh, of a okay. uh, uh, time, like I always know. I only had like one room was rented out to. Uh, I had two extra rooms, and I had one rented out. Uh, to, uh, you're a clean. You're really clean though. Yeah. You've so, always bought. You've so always I have been a higher. Way? Huh? You've always been that way. Yeah. And it was because I grew up in a, in a messy home. I hated that. So I, when I was a kid, uh, my and my sister's, Cassie's that way too. If you ever go to Cassie's house, she's like super- Spotless. She, yeah, her house yeah. is immaculate. And it's because we both had the same experience growing up in a like just disheveled house. And, you know, you'd be embarrassed and we'd be embarrassed to bring your friends over. Yeah. I never know. Like I bring my friends over and there'd be like, you know, laundry all over the, you know, the living room, you know, floor and the, and the, the dishes are all piled up in there. And, you know, it's, it, I remember like just that like cringing, like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to walk into my own house mm -hmm. with my friends and be embarrassed of that. And I swore that, man, when I move out on my own, like I'll always keep myself or all my stuff like really nice. So, but I mean, <clears throat> I had roommates that 
you know, I never let the house get messy because that I controlled that, but their bedrooms, they rent them. So I'm like, I wouldn't mess with them. And it wouldn't be until like after they left. Oh, like I told you guys the whole, the remember the guy that did all the Coke. I had all the, <laughs> yeah. the razor blade. I found like, I mean, I must've found a hundred half straws and yeah. razor blade marks in my window <laughs> seal. And like, had no idea this dude had a Coke wow. problem. Like you just thought I, he was energetic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> couldn't figure out why he could play video games. Ideas till four for new the, businesses. Couldn't figure out why he could play video games till four in the morning on a, on a, on a camping chair and then get up and go to work with me at seven. You know what I'm saying? Every day. Like, Damn, this dude's yeah, yeah. energy. Yeah. It's like, yeah, this Boundless. guy's figured it out, you know? So, <laughs> And then uh, I had a, another guy who, um, you know, he was a, a hardcore workout buff fit dude. And he would um, make big old meals like skillet. And I found like pans like under his bed of like half food. What still. is wrong with people? Yeah. yeah. Like, that's why I was like, how do you, how do you like what? leave a pan of half eaten food under your live with it? Yeah. Uh. And then like, yeah. And you slept on top of, and had girls over and shit like that. Like, how did that work out? Like, that's so weird. That like, you know, what my biggest pet peeve was with besides this disgusting mess everywhere was like, I would go into the bathroom and every time they'd take a shower, they were so big. They would step out and then just drip dry. And it would like, I was, I was always stepping into like wet and I was just like, <laughs> With your socks. You just put your just, socks on. Oh, oh, and I would yell and you know, <laughs> we'd wrestle and like, dude, it, <laughs> 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 Hey, back to this. <laughs> What? Zero gayness. Okay. <laughs> Zero percent. And had a pillow fight. Just, yeah. Yeah. No pillow fights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, don't throw me in there. Yeah. Don't throw me in there. You can't wear boxers on. It was totally normal. Yeah. You know? <laughs> they were wet and slippery, yeah. but it was all right. Yeah. yeah, speaking of showers, that place I moved into, I had to share a shower with that guy. Uh, I mean, like at a different the same time, time? No, different time, different, different time. <laughs> <laughs> but the walls, you know how showers get moldy? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The first time I saw it, the walls were just, it was black with mold. Ew. So that was my first job was to clean that. Now you're a clean guy too. So that must be. I'm clean. I can be messy, but I'm clean. Yeah. yeah. You can be <laughs> disorganized. I'm disorganized. Not yeah. dirty. There's I'm not a dirty. Between, I'm not dirty. Yeah. yeah. There's disorganized and there's dirty. Mm -hmm. What would you categorize yourself as? Disorganized. I'm disorganized. Mm -hmm. I'm not dirty. I don't like dirty. No, I shit. hate dirt. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I'm. I can be very disorganized because that's like what's in my head. So yeah. it just shows up. <laughs> just shows yeah. up outside. Just manifests. Yeah. 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 Speaking of disorganized, disorganized. But me to ask you this, Adam. Yeah. You've been looking uh, juicy lately. Oh, oh my yeah, god. Whoa. Working out. Uh, what's going on? I'm back. Um, I'm back into gyms, dude. And I have to say, you know, it's been over three years. You're gonna dust off your pro card and. <clears throat> you know, uh, I, I, I think you let me have my time long enough. I did. I, you know, I felt like, um, <laughs> son of a bitch. Well, Hey, to be honest, like I really thought that I, I think you, I thought you guys had, uh, influenced me so much that I had been converted. If those that have been listening to the show for a really long time could probably remember when we first would all have this kind of debate. Remember we'd have this argument. Oh, about, home gym versus yeah, home gym versus. And I was like, so staunch about working out of the gym. Well, then COVID happened and I was forced to work out at home or here then I started to tell you guys, well, you know what? I'm starting to see what you guys saw. Like, I like this and it's convenient. And I love the way I'm like, I'm doing these little 10 minute micro workouts. And I really liked a lot of that stuff. And it, and it, it did, it did me well for COVID. Right. I thought the, and when I look back now and I've came back now to the gyms, what I, what I like about the, the home is the convenience and flexibility. And I would say that having it is, uh, it kept me healthier than just having a gym membership. Right. right? Because, what what I found about having the home gym was it was easy for me to go, I can go in and just do a squat, you know? Right. I can just go do one little thing. And sometimes I would. Sometimes I would just do like three sets of squats. And that's yeah, all consistency I do. I would right. never drive to the gym and squat three times and then get out. Yeah. That would mm -hmm. never happen. If I go to the gym, I'm committed to an hour full-time workout, which as you can probably forget or figure out is that that's the pro and con to this is that what's nice about being back in the gym is my workouts are improving. Yeah, they're most yeah. consistent I've seen you in a while. Yeah, you can so, tell, dude. You've put on like like eight pounds. It looks like you've put on eight. Am I guessing right? Eight pounds of lean body mass since you started? You know, I haven't done a a DEXA scan, which I will do at the, the new gym that has one. Oh, you should have done it when you first started. I know, because I know. Because you've changed already since then. Yeah, oh, no, I've de I definitely have. Uh, my weight has stayed almost exactly the same, though. Yeah, I know, but I, yeah, so, you, you've definitely gained some muscle. I keep, I always keep, like, so when I first started, I always take a photo. So I have a, a log for mm -hmm. myself so I can mm -hmm. look back on the visual. I'm actually really not tracking weight that much. I get on here at our scale maybe, you know, once every couple of weeks just to kind of see where I'm floating around. I've been hanging right around 230. So I'm not moving much from 230. 
but I've completely changed my, my, my body. So it has, but you know, talking about the gyms, uh, you know, this is haven't been in one for over three years. So some things have changed really blown away by the amenities in this cheap fitness 19. Mm. So I got this membership at fitness. It was a kind of a cheaper, smaller club. They took over an old 24 hour fitness, but Wait, which one? Um, the old over in Morgan Hill. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah that's yeah, yeah. no longer twenty four. The, the tenant, uh, whatever yes, station yes, now. that yeah. one. Yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah, I come in and I'm just like, hey, I want to uh, give me a membership, and then they 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 pitch you the month to month, right? Like, you guys have some sort of a prepay, like you know, I'll just pay it all up and be done with it. He's like, oh, oh, well, yeah, we had that. It was like a couple hundred bucks. It was only like I think two eighty or three forty something like that. But then I have unlimited tanning, unlimited red light therapy, unlimited cryotherapy in addition to the gym access like you would what you would is that the oh yeah it's the gym right there and it's got i mean it's a cool little gym you know why that boy they have really capitalized on the whole sign people up and they never show up model and they've they've gone lower and lower and they provide more and more to figure out how we attract people and who's not going to show up because that's the only way they make listen this is okay and somebody's i know you we i get teased about this Mm -hmm. i think this is membership number five i have right now yeah that i'm paying for yeah um, but here's the justification. So m- my psoriasis does really well when I'm doing red light therapy and or tanning. And it has both of oh, these here. So, yeah. And so I have this motivation of like, well, shit, I, if I wouldn't pay for a tanning membership, I don't even know anywhere that does just pure red light therapy. So I can get the access to that other than mine mm-hmm. at home. And so I'm like, if you were to pay a, 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 a tanning salon, it would be 80 to hundred some bucks a month. Yeah. And then I have access to the cryo and wow. I have access to the red light therapy. Like that's in, wow. insane. Which, that's cool. Red light mm-hmm. therapy is getting commercial. Yeah. And theirs is a cool stand up bed where it, it hits me all the way around. Yeah. So yeah. I, I thought that was, it's, I mean, it's not juve. So I don't, what I don't know is the quality of the red light. Is it up to the standards of what juve is? It'd be really interesting to see like a comparison of like what other, Do you compa- know, the data on the red light therapy and psoriasis is pretty <coughs> remarkable. It's mm-hmm. like one of the more effective ways to treat So it. what I've never done is the combo of the two. I've experienced both of them individually and seen an impact. Yeah. Tanning makes a huge impact. When I was competing, obviously I was tanning a lot. And so it one of the best parts about that uh, is the what it did with my psoriasis. Yeah. I know what I've done with red light therapy of being consistent by using my juve and how much that's helped it. I'm curious of combining. Now, do you the do the red light pre or post workout? So it depends because what like some I've what I've done now is like I've alternated like sometimes I'll tan sometimes I'll do the red. I'm light wondering therapy. if because okay red light therapy reduces inflammation, but I normally do it post because I work out and then it's like nice to to do that after. Well, I was just gonna say so improves inf- improves that inflammatory process <clears throat> recovery, but then on the flip side activates the mitochondria, which could power workouts. So I wonder which is better. That's why I would love for you. To well, I've been, I've been doing the, the creatine stack with it. Right. So I oh, do right after workout, I do creatine and then the red light therapy yeah, is yeah, like yeah. the, the, the idea. Oh, and yeah. I know that's kind of like a theory right now, right? There's nothing to really support. Well, the, it's all mitochondrial function. Right. So I don't, I don't mean they're both, I don't know if, it, if stacking them at the same time makes a difference. It's a good theory though. I would think so. Well, yeah. Cause the creatine is getting uptaked into that. Right. Yep. And if you're, if you're enhancing the, the, basically the engine or the motor of a cell by yeah. doing the red light therapy, I would think that I'm just would, wondering what, if it would be better pre or post workout. I got to think about that. I um, mean, I think it's I've like, never, I've never used it in with a workout. <clears throat> My thought process on that is it's most likely like we talk about almost anything, which is the consistency of using it trumps <laughs> yeah, of course. the pre or yeah, of post course. of whatever it is. Of course. And what I find for me if I come in and I get heated up on a red light therapy or a tanning bed before I work out, I it, I don't feel right. Mm-hmm. I, I'd rather like get warm, like train, and then now that I'm coming down, I can stand in a, a bed all for pumped eight. Pumped up, yeah, all yeah, glistening. Yeah, look at my muscles. Yeah. <laughs> speaking, <laughs> speaking of getting so hot and bothered over there. <laughs> speaking of yeah, no, Justin, yeah. all those stories. Yeah. Speaking of wrestle, <laughs> no, you want to wrestle. wrestle? Speaking of heated up, uh, I got to talk about this on the show. What? This has to be, you know, through the course of the of the of the podcast. There's like moments that we will always talk about and remember. And we just had uh, Shailene Johnson on the podcast, and she's amazing. We'll air that episode. Great episode. She's a fitness icon. And next door, we have all this construction oh, that's God. going on. Oh my this god! This is great. Yes. So we have all this construction going on, 
next door. And sometimes you can kind of hear it. It's not that loud, not distracting. No, this time it was excessive. Bro, they like, were banging like on- Elephants were just smashing everything. On our, so we start the podcast. We're excited. She's a fitness icon. She really want to do a good job. Remember too, we're just getting to know her right now. Yeah. You could tell she's nervous. Yeah. So we're just, you know, but she's, she's a professional. So yeah. we're going. Right when she starts, start the cameras. Let's go. Banging, yeah. drilling. It's like jackhammer. It might as well be yeah. in the room, and we're still trying to do the podcast. I thought my guitar was going to fly off and like take Bro. me out. And I'm watching. I'm looking. I'm like trying to maintain focus. And and at one point, Doug goes over because Adam's signaling like, "Oh fuck!" Doug goes over, comes back, and nothing happens. And finally, Adam loses his shit. Oh, yeah. We have it on camera. Yeah. Can we please show Adam? Oh, do you have out? that on camera? We have to. Well, yeah, yeah, we we have all. Oh God. Adam jumps out of the chair and runs over it's there. And he looks so bad. Like I follow him because I'm like, ooh, is this going to be a fight? <laughs> like, And I hear him yelling. Uh, did you hear him yelling? No, I didn't hear. I, 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 I imagined what it was sounding like. <laughs> Here's the thing. Justin's like, I've seen enough of it. Yeah, yeah. I, knew, I, knew, I know how Adam goes. Uh, I had to like, I was thinking of doing the same thing, but I'm like, I'm going to cut her camera off. I get out in front and I'm like, there's no easy way for me to like get around. And cause it was at that level. It was just like, if we, it was distracting me. something like, bro, I'm it was making lose. Justin's guitar swing. <laughs> yeah. I'm dead serious. That I was know. like, that was like the tipping point for him. I'm like, dude, this is so bad, Doug. The fucking guitar is swinging. Like, it's like, <laughs> we can't do this. Like, this is crazy. Adam's yelling over there. Oh. Dude. All I hear is, and I'm like listening for like, yeah. oh, is there going to be some shit that happens? And then he walks back uh, and it was all good. Well, Doug, it's after Doug had came back, he then he's over here next to me and he's taking photos. And, and it's still banging. And I'm like, trying, I'm like, Doug, why didn't you go over to Joe or something? And he's like, I did. They don't speak any English. <laughs> like, fuck, they, gotta, they understand angry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I thought. I was like, they're going to understand crazy real quick here when I get hey, over there. <laughs> hey, truth though, it was better you than Doug. If Doug snaps, because here's the thing with Doug, <laughs> Doug holds it. Yeah. He holds yeah. it, holds it, yeah, holds D it. Doug's anger delivery I've seen, is different. <laughs> I've only seen, I've seen Adam lose his temper once a week. I've seen <laughs> Doug yeah, lose his temper yeah. twice in my entire life. One time, like one time on me and you, you see it. You're like, oh shit, that was bottled up. Yeah. Let's put it back inside. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it back inside. Get, get a little pressure valve. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. Doug would have done so some shit. I have a little more controlled anger. Well, cause you're, I know what I'm doing. You let it out. Directed <laughs> anger. You're like a volcano. Anger. You let out the Very steam. Directed. There's no eruption or whatever. Doug's like Yellowstone. Like, oh shit. Hey, we, didn't, we, didn't hear, we didn't hear a peep afterwards, right? No, I mean, no, no, no. They didn't that. even say anything to me. They just all stopped. They dropped their tools. They looked at me and they could see how crazy I looked. <laughs> mad I was. It's just like. <laughs> I couldn't hear what you're saying. But the, wild, said, rawr, rawr, rawr. the wild part was so, that, so the audience can get an idea of what's going on here. So next door, you're talking about 4,000 square feet. It's a decent sized building. It's a giant big square. They've been dimming over yeah. there for the last month or whatever. And of all the mornings, this morning, literally the whole crew, yeah. there's five of them, uh -huh. are all working on, on this the, wall. the, I don't know, what is that, little, 20 little feet? Little bobcat 20, and everything in there just smashing walls. 20 feet of wall <laughs> in a 4,000 square foot. They are all banging on it. Like one guy's got a jackhammer, <laughs> the other guy's got a sledgehammer, the other guy's got a shovel. It's comical, yeah, dude. It was, yeah, it was comical. It yeah. was like, literally, you guys could not make this worse by by today, by like rank. And at that time, when There's we're another guy with a stick of dynamite, he's just uh, like, you guys, yeah, yeah, what should I like this? There's <laughs> <laughs> a guy with, with drumsticks. Just, <laughs> oh, <laughs> just, oh, just fuck with these guys. All Can you remember all of I remember, <laughs> so I remember we have wrestlers. the first time like everybody has seen like that side of all of us, right? I think everybody has had their moment of like I mean we talk about Justin when he stormed out when he thought he was so I, we we've never seen oh, yeah. I've never seen Justin lose it though but I bro think what are you talking about when he slammed that's exactly what I did I pushed the mic away and I got it like when he left the room yeah but he, he's never like yelled or screamed yeah. or anything well, like that's that. not his style yeah, yeah, yeah uh, something I style. think he keeps it bottled pretty good that's yeah. what I think yeah uh, no, I don't think I've ever lost have in. I ever lost I can, I can get loud but I don't think I've ever lost you and sure. I have gotten into a few loud arguments before. yeah there's been a few discussions there were discussions 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 <laughs> High volume discussion. And they brought us closer every time. Yeah. I mean, does yes or no? Because, oh, always. Every, always. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do you remember the first time, like maybe you before you even knew ways. how we were all going to yeah. work together, like the first time Sal and I got into it? Do you I, remember? Like, I don't first? remember the first time, but I do recall the times. <laughs> and uh, it's always a little bit stressful. <laughs> you still, does you still get stressed? Uh, yeah, I know it's going to blow over. 
I, I was, was going to say you can't over. get stressed till now. Many times as it's happened. Oh yeah, no, no. no I just, not even I, we that's just, what I mean. There Justin a- and I just sit over here, wait for things to calm down, and then we can say something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's how it works. And, and, then, and, then, we, and then we try wait to get you guys a storm. Then we try kinda... to get you guys to pick sides. Yeah, was, <laughs> yeah. There's always one. There's always one of us who tries to recruit the other. What do you think, Doug? Yeah. Which line are you? What do you think, <laughs> Justin? Yeah. As we stare at him, like it sucks when it sucks when either one, when both of us get one each. Yeah, 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 yeah. It helps nothing. Andrew, you're the fucking tiebreaker now, bro. That's what you Welcome need. to the team. Yeah, we do need a fifth. Yeah, no, oh, it's a no, good time. Dude. I, hey, 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 truth, man. When you got friends that you could argue with and then afterwards respect each other, yeah. that's And, and it's fr- always immediate. You know, it doesn't take long before it's like it, no. it, it settles and it's, it what, just has to come you, out. What do you think that, what do you think the main characteristic is that makes that okay and work? Like my theory and thought is, is that it, even though there's this 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 fighting or whatever going back and forth, that it's not from a place of ego, right? right? It's not from a place of, um, and and I've been in that place before where I I want to be right, I care about that, and I'm like, and you and you just yeah. that versus like it, it's it it does truly come from a, a place of, of love that we share. We love this business. We love what we're building. We love what we're creating so much. It's just passion that we're passionate behind yeah. it. That we're we're willing to fight well, for I, it. I, I, what it is, I think there's always ego, but I think that that's why the tempers get lost, right? That's what it comes from. But I think that I, that tr- the trust that the other person wants something good. I don't think that you will have ill intent. Never. So for, ah, oh, we're yelling, arguing, whatever. I'm not thinking this, this guy's trying to, you know, fuck me over. This guy has bad intention. <clears throat> yeah. Never enters my mind. So I think that's what keeps it always like good and respectful and at the end it's like it's, yeah i think we i think we all when we if we fight like that we all have the same desired outcome that's it that's it mm-hmm. right yeah. so it's it's just we we really strongly disagree with the pursuit to that desired right. outcome right. right but i mean ultimately if we both agree on hey this is we're trying to better this business yeah. like the, and, and and I think that's why our that's why how I feel when we any of us argue about that stuff it's because we both want it's ne, it's never selfishly driven it's no. never you or Justin or Doug arguing because you want more of something no. or I think that you're trying to get over or anything like that it's always like this is the best path I think for what we're trying to accomplish and we disagree and ultimately what's been yeah. proven which I think has made it even better is that at the end whichever direction is decided everybody's on board. Yeah. Even, even if you were against it, well, this and even if it doesn't work out, yeah. Oh, and if it doesn't work out, it's all of it's our a loss. Team loss. Yeah. yeah, we don't. You know, that's why I respect that about you guys. I wanted to bring to find. bring something up to Justin because he wasn't in the conversation, and I think we had it off air. So I hope I'm not duplicating this conversation because I thought it was really interesting. Wasn't it off air when we were talking to Kara about the the dog? It was off air, right? It was. So did you hear about the Chat GPT? And the guy's dog curing the dog. Yeah. No. Uh-uh. Yeah. So this guy had a uh, I don't remember what kind of breed of dog it was, or whatever. But he uh, his dog was like deathly ill, was dying, couldn't figure out what it was. Rushed him to the vet. Vet run the panels, blood work, lab stuff, right? And came back and said, "Oh, your dog has this." And then he gave him like the medication. Goes home. He's giving his dog the medication, and the dog is getting progressively worse. And he's looking like he's going to die, so he's freaking out. So he takes the 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 lab work, uploads it into Chat GPT to get chat GBT's opinion on what are some of the possibilities that this dog could have. Mm. And it spit out three options instead of one. One of the three was what the vet said. Then there was two other ones. And then he figured out, I don't know how he teased out one of he them. He brought it back to another vet. Yeah. And he said, here's the other opinion. Op- and they saw it and they cured the dog wow. all through chat. GBT. And it's not even optimized for that, for medical la- for labs and stuff like that. Huh? So Isn't that cool. That is cool. Yeah. I mean, so there's a bit of optimism there. Meanwhile, you get all the other articles about like it uh, coercing I mean, somebody to you know, kill the, themselves. I like your theory about it being the Antichrist. I agree. Yeah. Give us everything we want. Give until, us everything we want until it kills us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's there see what happens. So that was good news. Okay. Then I saw something that I thought was interesting that was on the bad news side that I thought was fascinating. And it, you probably I won't be surprised, but I thought the number was high. Do you know how many schools have contracts with Pepsi and Coke? I do because we have the we have it written up. There <laughs> you dick. Eighty <laughs> percent. <laughs> Isn't that spoiling the answer? Isn't that? I know. That's wild. I know. Eighty percent of schools have a contract with Coke and Pepsi. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's that's nuts to me. Yep. And then we just and then and then that, that remember I brought up the other day the 
uh, lunchables, you know? Yeah. So that's what we're- It's not about lunchables. health, it's business. That's right. Know? Yeah. It is 100%. 100% about, uh, 100%, 100% about always. making money. And that's what we're teaching the generation coming totally. up is yeah. lunchables and sodas. Great. There you go. Do we have a, a shout out that we want to do today? No, I got one for you guys. I got a shout out. I don't know if I've, I don't think I've given this guy, the guy a shout out. Jonathan Pejao, I think is how oh, you say the, his last name. Is that the religious guy? He's not religious. He's an expert on symbolism. Oh. Um, and if you want to like watch videos and go deep mm. and listen to an intellectual that bl that's going to really blow your mind on a lot of different things. Didn't him, him and Peterson do an interview? Yeah, dude. And I, I mean, I, I can I, if I watch his stuff, wow, I'll get symbolism lost. that he, uh, he's an expert on it that's and he explains awesome. the value of it, the, the relevance. Um, and so he can go into religion. He can go into art. He can go into architecture. Um, why we talk the way we do, why our behaviors are the yeah. way we are, and the, the psychology <clears throat> behind it. So it's Jonathan with a J dot page U P A G E A U. Interesting. Really, really interesting stuff. Yeah. Hey, check this out. Do you want to sleep better, recover faster, improve your hormone profile? Try Sleep Me. This is a device, uh, it's a pad that goes over your bed that uses water to cool or warm your bed so that you have the perfect temperature for the perfect circadian rhythm. Studies show that sleeping in the right temperature has a profound effect on sleep quality. And these devices are pretty amazing. They control the temperature. They can warm up in the morning to wake you up. You have two sides to them, so you and your partner can have different temperature controls. It's pretty awesome. Go check them out. Go to sleep.me forward slash pump 30 and get 25% off any of their sleep systems. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Jeffrey from Alabama. Jeffrey, what's happening? How can we help you, man? Hey, nice to meet you guys. Good morning. What up? All right. Hey, I uh, didn't want to take up too much of the time slot with the uh, obligatory appreciation, but I did want to say how much I appreciate all the stuff you guys do, all the tips you have, uh, a bunch of little things that I've added to my lifestyle that have really helped me out. Um, I've got my wife running MAPS Anabolic now. She wouldn't be able to tell you that's what she's doing, but... Uh, that's what she's running. And uh, the product recommendations like uh, Mass Zombs for sure has been a huge game changer for me. So uh, thank you to everything you guys do. Awesome. awesome. Thanks, thank man. you. So uh, jumping right into my question, um, how do you plan for someone who has long-term strength goals in the gym but without any time constraints such as a competition? I would like to hit specific strength targets in my life such as a 500-plus pound squat, 400 bench, and 600 deadlift. However, I don't have any deadline to achieve these targets. I just want to do them in the healthiest way possible without sacrificing overall health and fitness. Damn, I love this question. Yeah, I really do. We, where where, are, where we, are your lifts now, by the way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think we can help you. You're already stronger than most of us. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, squat, uh, my max is like 375, but okay. Monday through Sunday, I can roll out of bed and hit 345 no matter how I'm feeling. Uh, bench is 295, deadlifts 425. So. Okay. How long have you been training for? So super consistent for about two years, stepped in the gym for the first time at 22. So about uh, 12 years ago now. Okay. And you're 20, oh wait, how old are you now? 34, 35? I'm 33, about to be 34, right? Okay. And the reason why I'm asking this is as I just want to make sure that these are somewhat realistic uh, goals. Um, uh, I, how, how much do you weigh, by the way, body weight? Uh, so, like I said, the mass album has been a huge thing. I was stuck at like 180 for a while, uh, even eating 4,000 calories. I just wasn't processing it. Eating the exact same calories now, I've gotten up to 200. Isn't that crazy how much of a difference it makes when you can digest something? That was huge. Yeah. It's pretty wild. Okay, so these goals are lofty but possible, but they're big goals. Yeah. Now, I like the fact that you have goals and that you said you don't have time constraints and you want to do this in the healthiest way, way possible because – because these are big goals, like that's that's a big squat, big bench, and a big deadlift. And here's what happens the stronger you get. First off, it, when people first start working out, strength is one of the best things to focus on. But the stronger you get, the higher the risk becomes with lifting heavier and the less of the reward you get in terms of the risk to reward ratio. For example, if you're squatting 250 and your form is all off a little bit, the risk is not nearly as high as if you're squatting, let's say, 450, right? So the most important thing you can do when chasing a goal like this is to alternate heavy powerlifting style strength training, which is very effective at getting you stronger with a focus on mobility yeah. slash Functional. hypertrophy. Yeah. yeah. Because the what's going to get in your way of, of these goals 
more than off, uh, more often than not, is your your function in mobility and then potential instability or risk of injury. So if you can alternate very intelligently, performance with and power lift back and forth. Performance and power lift symmetry yeah. would be good. Mm -hmm. Even yeah, exactly. I would even throw in some bodybuilding hypertrophy training, but basically alternate with a focus on power lifting, mm -hmm. and little by little you'll get close to this goal, maybe even hit it but you won't hit those roadblocks that tend to hit people at this strength phase, which is like at that level, it's injury and instability. That's what stops people. What pro what programs do you have of ours right now? So I have the build your butt bundle that I got for my wife. So I, uh, it has anabolic, um, aesthetic and, uh, kettlebell, I believe. And then I have power lift. I picked that up in January, but I haven't started it yet. Um, I was kind of finishing the split that I'm on before I looked into it. Yeah, I would really, I would run power lift, then uh, then performance, and then he could run power lift again. Yeah, yeah, he could just go keep going Stack back and forth, back yeah. and forth, and then uh, like Sal said, even like symmetry. I think uh, to interrupt that, just because, I mean, it's it's so intensely focused. Uh, like your joints are going to get a lot of stress, and so to to constantly keep that in check, I think is mm -hmm. going to be vital if you're trying to do this the healthy way. Yeah, I also think Prime Pro might be good for you. <clears throat> In between, if things start to to start to happen, it's almost inevitable that you're going to run into some roadblocks when it comes to stability. When you're pushing those kind of numbers. at that level, yeah, yeah. okay, at that level, you'll start to <clears throat> notice things, and you'll have to kind of troubleshoot. You'll have to take a few steps back before moving forward. You know, to give you an example, um, you know, I was, uh, you know, I well, I think I was in my early 30s, and I hit 600 pounds in the deadlift, and that was like my PR. And then, uh, you know, throughout the rest of the time I'd been training, I, you know, I had that number in my mind, but I was comfortable with 500, maybe, you know, mid 500s, low 500s. And then at one point I'd try to push it and I'd kind of tweak something and then I'd back off and tweak something. And so I went through six months of focusing on working on what the issues were, even avoiding deadlifts for a little while, focusing on single joint exercises. Um, and eventually I went back to pursuing that by doing these kind of micro, you know, maps 15 style workouts, which I'd never tried before. And I was able to break that record, uh, you know, much at a much older age, but I had to take a lot of steps back. And so that's the process that you're going to go through hitting those numbers. There's very few people in the world <clears throat> That I mean, because it, it, it's you know, uh, this is hard to understand if you follow strength people on on Instagram. It looks like everybody could squat <laughs> five hundred pounds, and everybody could bench press four hundred pounds, and everybody could deadlift six hundred pounds. But the reality is that would place you; it, those lifts would place you in the you know point one percent, maybe even even smaller percent of the world. So it's going to be a slow process, and the key is going to be stability functionality, and then pursuing strength and then backing out. And the, the trick is going to be not waiting until that's right. those issues come the, up. The right. temptation ahead of it. The temptation is going to be, you're going to run maps, power lift. You're going to see great results. You're going to see all those probably go up and then you're going to want to run it again. And you may, and like the average person may run something like that again and actually get away with yeah. it one more time. And then what will happen is they'll be tempted to do it a third time because they'll see gains again. And then by that third time, they've been working in that sagittal plane so much and neglecting mm -hmm. all the other planes and mobility mm -hmm. work that all of a sudden their joints start talking to them. And then they see their hard plateau in some sort of a regression. The goal would be, okay, I'm going to run power lift. I'm going to get my gains. I'm going to resist the temptation to run it again. I'm going to go over, do something like MAPS performance, which is multi-planier stuff, mobility work, do all that, not worrying about hitting PRs or anything like that at that time. Then get back into power lift again. Yeah. And you just kind of keep cycling a good like mobility focused program in between your power lifting cycles. To me, that would be the smartest, best way to get to there. Uh, in a healthy way to where you could sustain those type of lifts. And those are, those are huge goals. Those are amazing, especially for your size. You look bigger. <laughs> I thought you were like two two twenty two 222 plus. I mean, that's 180 to 200 pounds hitting those numbers. That's, those are legit numbers yeah, right there. That's huge. <clears throat> yeah. I really appreciate all the advice. Um, like I've, I've had some setbacks with bench press specifically, not so much with squat alternating between back squat and front squat. I've been able to kind of steadily progress on that, but, uh, if it's unilateral, I'm terrible. Like I can probably barely split squat like 135, even though my squat's where it is. So oh, wow. working in oh. those. Well, that's working in those. That's a good sign. Planes is something that uh, 
I haven't done much and that I haven't focused on. So, oh, you identify that'll get you stronger right away. Totally, yeah. yeah. yeah if you focus on that, yep. I, I'll, I'll let's send you p- uh, uh, performance and uh, I'll send you symmetry too. I think both of those will benefit you. Yeah, and you can awesome. alternate those with power lift. Yeah. And um, don't wait until you start to feel something happen. <clears throat> the best thing you could possibly do is you feel good and then you move into mobility and functional mm-hmm. style training. Also, I want to highlight what you already found out yourself. When you see that, like that's actually a really good thing for you. For someone who's chasing continued strength gains and you want to get bigger and stronger and you see that you kind of suck at like a Bulgarian split squat or whatever and you're like you're significantly weaker, that's actually a huge opportunity for growth and gains for you. Mm-hmm. As much as it sucks the, for the ego cuz you got to strip down all this weight and yeah. you know you can squat, you could bilateral squat way more the value of you sticking towards that, you know, unilateral type of movement and getting strong in it and, and sucking at it for you're a while. Eliminating a weak link in the chain. Yeah. And you and then when you come back to the bilateral work, you're gonna see huge improvements. Awesome. All right. Thanks for calling in, man. We'll send those over to you. Absolutely. I appreciate it, guys. You got it. Uh, you know, Adam, you made a really good point that uh took me a long time to figure out, which is it's one thing to be stuck in the plateau and to not see any glaring holes. Like oh, everything kind of, it's hard to figure out, but when you're stuck and then you see like this big difference between let's say right and left side, or huge opportunity, a split stance versus bilateral uh, or dumbbells versus barbells. That's like a very easy, like, Oh, let me just bring that ratio up to where it probably should be. Mm-hmm. And then watch what happens. I mean, that's such a good, such a good point. You it is, yeah. but you know, I, uh, I don't look at it that way. <clears throat> well, it's hard. Like I, so th- obviously we're all in our forties, so it's easy to talk about that. Now, if yeah. I really, if I take myself back to my twenties and I remember the first time that I, I was introduced to Bulgarian split squat, it was something that I wouldn't do. Yeah. I wouldn't do it. Cause I, I mean, I was so weak in the Bulgarian that I could hold 20 pound dumbbells and I was just lit up, yeah, yeah. lit up. And I was like, fuck that. And you just like, dismiss it. Like, yeah. it's stupid. My girlfriend's right next to me holding 15s. I got 20s. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. Good. I'm putting the barbell back on my back to where she's like, at least do that. some serious weight. And so I would avoid it for those reasons. And that, of course, that's the, the young, naive side of me. As I've gotten older and wiser and understand the benefits that you just highlighted, it's like, man, now I look forward to that. If I see a discrepancy in my training today where I'm like, oh shit, I'm hella weak right there. It's like, oh, that's those those are gains to be had right, right. there. That's how I see it now. Because what's the the usual thing you see when people want are pursuing like big numbers like this? It's like they want to stay in that sagittal plane. They want to just add any kind of extra help. Either it's like, you know, we get some kind of help support aids in terms of security around yes. the joints or we're going to go the the pharmaceutical route you know and, and that's what you see in like so to to be able to actually look at it from a perspective of health and like how to do this to where you're building your entire body up so it actually can withstand that amount of force it's a completely different playbook yeah, yeah one thing that i did with that adam was uh that i i, I started doing uh i'd say probably over the last maybe a couple of years is i only lift really heavy when I work out alone, when I'm in here or in my garage mm. and when I'm in front of other people now, I make it a point mm. to make it about technique form and getting the pump. Yeah. And I do that on purpose because uh, it trains my ego. Otherwise right. I get caught up in the like Instead of peacocking. And, yeah, yeah. And then you get caught up in shitty form and yeah. I don't want to do that exercise or whatever. But now it's like, I will only lift heavy. I will only test my strength when I'm in here and it's just us or I'm by myself because then it's it, like my, uh, <clears throat> my calf training hack. Yes. Where I wore shorts for a year. Yeah. It's like oh, I yeah. force myself to wear shorts every single <laughs> yeah, day. Totally. It's like, okay, I'm gonna deal with this insecurity. <laughs> Our next caller is Anano from South Korea. Anano, how can we help you? Hi guys. So excited and nervous right now. <laughs> so is Justin. Don't worry. I'm always nervous. And talk with you. Um, Struggling with um, severe depression and I have no idea how much your helped me and your programs. You guys basically like brought me back to life. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. And um, I will question simple and I only have one question. So uh, I anabolic twice and now I'm running a MAPS aesthetic. In difference from prison from with maps anabolic, I feel that I don't enough if that makes sense. The 
uh, workouts, I don't feel or uh, any fatigue as if I've worked out all, at all. Thing is that I myself during the sets, my deadlifts and squats and then um, increased. Challenging when I'm doing that, like as I move to, towards the ends of. Uh, I don't really feel any kind of effect how to explain it. I don't feel like anything. Should, should I increase my weights or um, in tempo or like what shall I do? Okay, is so it, let me... Is, let is me it anabolic she's not feeling? No, aesthetic. So, okay, so Anano, just, you're cutting out a little bit, so I'm just going to re kind of re-say what you said a little bit just for the audience. First off, uh, um, I'm really happy that we could help you during those uh, dark and hard times, um, that is like uh, when we hear stuff like that. That's uh, yeah, that really that's what it's all about. Yeah, that really us. drives us. So I appreciate you you sharing that. Um, now, your question essentially is: you're following Maps Aesthetic. You're getting stronger. You finish your set. Um, you in your question, you said you're resting for 90 seconds is recommended, but you just don't feel tired and fatigued. And so your question is: basically, are you doing something wrong? Should you push yourself harder in order to get that feeling of fatigue? No. In yeah. fact, if you're getting stronger, that is all the evidence you need that you're moving in the right direction. Number two, this is strength training. This is not uh, endurance or stamina training. Now, if I was training you for endurance or stamina, we would definitely want to push that kind of fatigue that you're asking about. But when it comes to strength training, I, ideally, uh, especially if you're getting stronger, you should feel pretty fresh. Yeah, like energized. To get to your next set. So it's not the same as like circuit training or hit training or cardio type training. You should you shouldn't feel tons of fatigue. You, and if you're getting stronger, it means you're moving in the right direction. So this is actually very very good uh, what you're experiencing. This is great. All right, thank you so much. Yeah. So everything is okay. I should keep going like this. You're doing good. Sounds yeah. like sounds like you're getting good. stronger. Yeah. If you keep getting stronger, you are completely on the right track. You're moving. You, this is excellent. Um, and no, you shouldn't feel beat up or fatigued after your workout. In fact, uh, what we say on the show all the time is you should feel, if you're doing strength training, you should feel good at the end of your workout. Not like you beat yourself up. That's actually a good indicator. It means you're, you're utilizing the type of intensity that you should probably utilize most of the time with your training to get long-term successful, uh, you know, results. Um, now that being said, I'd like to send you a free program just cause you called in Anano. Um, you did MAPS Anabolic. You're doing MAPS Aesthetic. MAPS Performance. Yeah. Uh, do you have MAPS Performance? Uh, I don't. I actually have Time Crunch Bundle and Advanced and Skinny Guy Bundle. Oh, good. We'll send you Performance. Now, here's the thing about oh, Performance. Okay. There's there's a, there's a phase in Performance because it's an athletic-minded training program where you are training for stamina. So there's one of the phases there where you will feel that fatigue, and that's totally normal because you're training in a particular phase for stamina. But we'll send that to you, and you can follow that one after aesthetic if you want. Thank you so much. Um, can I just ask a tiny question about anabolic? Sure, yeah. it's okay. Yes. Uh, so I know, guys, you guys always, and it, the program also has trigger sessions. But I ran it twice, and I, I was, to, it, I was struggling with my mental health, and it was really hard for me to push myself to do trigger sessions. Uh, so even though I did not do them, I still lost weight, gained muscle, and uh, lost body fat. Uh, so how much importance does it have, these trigger sessions? It'll add about 5% to the program. Yeah. You know, 95% right. of the program is foundational workouts. Five, and 5% is not a little. Like there isn't a supplement in the world you could take that would give you 5% improvement. So it, you'll notice. If yeah, you you'll did notice the your recovery will, will bounce back a lot. Uh, faster if you do apply those and it, it actually will uh, contribute towards uh, the next workout. You actually feel a bit more strength going into it. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely there, but it's not the majority, you know, yeah. trigger sessions are, are there to kind of add a little turbo to the program. And it's not a lot of intensity. So you just keep it very low intensity, even very moderate. Yeah. Thank you so much. You <laughs> it, got it. It's, it's always great to listen to you guys. Thank you so much. You hang in there, huh? Yeah. Hey, it's good to see you smile. Thank you. <laughs> thank you you got it that's always hits me when i hear someone say something like that yeah you know? yeah because we're not i mean our intentions to help people with fitness but to hear that all the way from south korea huh yeah, yeah all the way from over there is that why the is that why it was choppy yeah it takes a while for the signal 
to get across the ocean. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. You, you know <laughs> how that works, Adam? <laughs> yeah. No idea. I was like, no. all that cable they lay. I don't think they're making it up. <laughs> the uh, dinosaurs. I have no idea. You know what? I, I tell you, um, it's this is you don't hear this too much with people asking us questions because they listen to the show. But this is a common question people clients uh, that I would train would have is they'd be like, "Well, I'm not like." Get breathing, you know, gasping for air. I'm not like sweating off my, you know, uh, you know, off my butt. Like, what's going on? Yeah, it's like this is strength training. You're, it's not the same. If you you should feel fresh for your next set. This, this, is, this, this is this is exactly one, what we want to feel. <clears throat> this mm-hmm. one and the scale not moving, which yeah. is so funny to me. You know, it's like, I mean, and it's I'm I'm back on my kick right now, so I'm experiencing both these things right now, and it just reminds me of like this is like one of the biggest struggles for people that are getting started. Is one. I've been going, I'm dialed on my diet, training every day for the last month, uh, and the scale is staying the same. The average person would get super frustrated. Yeah. Then, where I go, that's like the yeah, perfect yeah, place so to be. Crush right. It. And then the same, I'm 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 weaker than I've ever been, but every workout I'm getting a little bit stronger. And so it's like, if I'm getting stronger, my weight is staying the same. Like I'm in You that, know what's happening. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm in this beautiful sweet spot. But boy, that really gets people, you know what I'm saying? To not oh, I'm not killing myself. I'm not super sore. I'm not like, yeah. you know, it's like they feel like they need to be crushed, exhausted, or super sore on the workout side. And then on the scale side, they feel like they need to see this swing up or down depending on what their goal is. And the truth is you actually want to see neither one of those. You want to see this nice, steady gains yep. and strength. And feel good. And you want to feel good. You don't want to feel exhausted afterwards. You, and you want to see your scale kind of say the same. And then you have this beautiful exchange of losing body fat and building muscle. And that's a great place to be. But it's such a challenging place to be mentally. Yeah. And the mm-hmm. other side of that is, uh, or they'll realize what you're saying. And then they'll say something like this. Well, if I go harder, yeah. I'll make oh, yeah. it happen even Maybe faster. Make it press a little <laughs> yeah, bit. Yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah. And they really screwed up. Our next caller is Jeff from Pennsylvania. Jeff, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey, what's up, guys? How what's you doing? On? What's happening? So, uh, so my wife actually turned me on to this show. Um, I watch more like bodybuilding, you know, a lot of bodybuilding podcasts. And you guys have quickly become like my number one go-to podcast. So, Hell yeah. it's pretty cool. She's a keeper. Yeah, <laughs> yeah she is. <laughs> so, um, so my, my questions are, I have a couple, couple different uh, topics, I guess. So, um, a lot of, like, I have, I guess... I have a form. My wife thinks I have a form of like body dysmorphia where I, I, I can't constantly get like, um, you know, Hey, you look huge. You look this, you know, like you look that. And I just, I don't believe it myself. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. So, um, so I'm trying to like diet down with, um, uh, with carbs and I can never seem to like to, to get a good diet or stay consistent with the diet with carbohydrates. So I cut them out and, um, and I do good. I do fine. Last year, I cut from like 240 down to 207. Um, and that was probably at the expense of some muscle loss. Um, so I just, I have a hard time like sticking to the diet with carbs um, due to my, my job. I work in corrections. So um, I just want to, I'm obsessed with being as big as possible, you know? And, um, and um, so I just, I have like a hard time just, just staying on a diet with carbs. So like I said, I cut them out. I do like a keto diet and, um, and that seems to work for me. Um, how would you, I just, I, I don't want to give up. I'm having a hard time, like maintaining the size that I put on with the carbs, without the carbs. Yeah. So good question. So, uh, I'm going to just add something to what you said. You said it works for you. It, it doesn't, it's not something that works for you. Right. So, and you can cut with carbs. I mean, I'm sure you're aware of that, right? Like you could just cut your calories keep the protein high and still drop body fat. You can also cycle them, which I love to do. Yeah. You could also carb cycle. The, ch- the challenge with when, when, when you're somebody that um, has a little bit of body dysmorphia, which I can completely relate to um, with cutting carbs is you lose water and muscle fullness and you just feel smaller, especially in those beginning stages. You don't get a good pump. You just start to feel smaller your strength goes down because the carbs, you know, you lose the glycogen. So you're losing, you're, you're not as strong in the gym and it really starts to mess with your head. It really does start to mess with your head. So that's the challenge with uh, cutting carbs as a way to get, uh, to get leaner. Um, so you can cut without having to cut carbs or you could cycle the carbs. The other thing is uh, that, you know, cause I had the similar issue with uh, that you have when I would get leaner, I would just feel smaller. 
Yeah. Is that um, I ignored, I literally ignored the feelings of feeling smaller and I just continued to get leaner. And at some point you get to a body fat. Now this is not necessarily what's going to help you with your body dysmorphia. If anything, it might make it worse, <laughs> but, but it, I got to a point where I started to really get lean and then it'd work out in like a tank top and I would look bigger. Okay. But you got to get down to like 10, 9%, 8% body fat for that to start to happen. And then you start to develop a relationship with getting lean where you're like, Oh, I look big when I'm lean. Now that's not going to solve the body dysmorphia issue. That's going to kind of help you with the get lean issue. The body yeah. dysmorphia issue is much more complex and that's going to take a lot of, that's going to take a lot of work, uh, um, you know, personal work on yourself and maybe even working with somebody, um, who can help walk you through that. Cause that's a, that's something that's a much more challenging. So I love to carb cycle when I cut like this and for sure, the most challenging part is there's about, I don't know, almost every show I ever did, I'd say there's about a, a three to four week phase that I don't like the way I look. I'm, I'm like, I'm, I've been in a cut already for like a month or more. And, and like Sal saying, you're, you're depleted. And when you're depleted of carbohydrates, you got to understand that our, our muscle bellies are all carbs and water, right? It's all glucose and water. So if you pull all the carbohydrates out, it's going to flatten what we call in bodybuilding, the flat look. So it gives you this yeah. kind of flat look. And for guys that like being big, that like myself and probably like you, uh, that really fucks with your head. And you're like, man, I just, I'd rather be a little fluffier and have all of this fullness to me because I feel better and look better. And to Sal's point, I knew I just had to keep going. I had to keep going past that point. Now, what would help me is every third or fourth day, I would refeed with lots of carbohydrates and I'd fill all out. And then I'd have this great workout. And then it would remind me of like, oh, I'm not, I'm not a lot smaller. I'm just depleted. And that's part of the process of getting kind of shredded is you're, you stay in this depleted phase for you know, extended periods of time because that's what forces the body over to utilize fat as its primary source of fuel. And every time you come out of that, it, then it goes jumps back into using glucose. And so I would jump out of it for one day out of the week just so I could see my body all filled out and go like, oh, okay, I'm not, I'm not little, but I'm depleted. And so I like that idea of cycling every three to four weeks for the mental aspect of how I look. And it helped me through that process. And then I got over this like, you know, it's crazy. And it, it took probably a, a few times of getting really lean and shredded and enough people walking up to me after I'd lose 30 pounds, they'd go, damn, dude, how'd you get so big? And I'd be like, what? I'm 30 pounds lighter than what I was at the beginning of my cut. But, you know, you look, yes. you look better. You look bigger. You look bigger. You look better. And so it's kind of working through that mental process. But if you if you've never carb cycled, I I mean I'm a I'm a big fan of doing that than going pure keto. I you go like, every three every three every third day. Every third to fourth day, I actually like four. The traditional way of carb cycling is three days, but I like going I like Stretching going like yeah, bit. too low, medium, and then a high. And that was like that was my formula for me. Like that I thought worked really well, and I'd see myself lean out. And then all I needed was one day a week of me filling back out to to remind myself like okay, I'm not I'm not tiny, I'm not small. It's just I'm depleted. That's all. Yeah, so I have tried carb cycling. I've tried like Justin Harris's carb cycling protocol and just different things. And I just, I get so like bloated uh, on the carb days. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I just get like to the point where I'm, you know, I'm nauseous. Like, you know, I have thrown up. Oh, like, wow. Just like, you know. You went too have hard. You, yeah, I was going to say, have you, have you, have you played it? Have you paid attention to certain types of carbohydrates? Because that's another thing that I over competing. Or so even the amount. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Maybe, maybe the amount is just too much. Like it's just a lot of white rice, you know, like, and just, I just feel like I'm, and then I kind of lose control. Like I start to like binge and slide. Oh, there you and, go. Yeah. There you, go. you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. That's, so that's kind of, that, that was one of the things I saw a lot in the competitive world is bodybuilders that would on their quote unquote refeed days, they'd be eating shit. They'd eat all kinds of stuff where I stayed disciplined. You know, it was always sweet potatoes, white rice, and like maybe quinoa. Also was, keep this in mind, Jeff, like what would be considered a, a carb low day? It can really vary depending on the individual and their sensitivity to carbohydrates. That, that's right. Especially for somebody who says that they've ran low to no carb for extended period of times. So when I was competing, I got to a point where I could eat 600 grams of carbs and my body loved it, absorbed it. And I looked great on it today. I can't eat more than about 250 to 300 because I've completely flipped the way I eat. And for an extended period of time, I've been low carb 
So now my body has recalibrated to that. So now if I wanted to do a quote unquote refeed day or what I'd call a high carb day now, it'd be 350, maybe 400. Yeah. I couldn't, if I hit 600, I'd probably throw up. Even for, even for me, my high, my carb load days, uh, loading days were like 175 for me. And I'm just very, okay. sens I'm just very sensitive to carbohydrates because I would experience what you would get. I'd get that nausea from the insulin, you know, spike, the glucose spike, I'd get bloating. So it was like, you know, 150, 175 was my hard, high carb day. So you're, you're just going too hard on that carb load day. Yeah, I was, there's probably, I was probably around 500 for, for a high carb day. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's probably just too much, especially for a guy like you who actually has run low to no carb too. Yeah, if you're going like, yes. if you're going like 50 grams of carbs on your keto days or 70 grams of carbs, try 150, 200 grams of carbs on your load days. See how you feel. Okay. I want to have, I'm going to have, I want to have Doug, uh, cause I'm like really curious to help you through this process too, because this is kind of a, this is where you can't really just take somebody else's advice, even our advice and just like, Oh, the guy said, eat this, this, and this, I'm yeah. gonna go do it. Like we got to kind of try some things to kind of figure sure, out sure. where that sweet spot is for you. So I want Doug to put you in the, the private forum. And then I'd love to kind of hear you, you know, playing with some of these different protocols and then giving, giving us feedback so I can hear, yeah. hear how you're feeling when you do certain things and then and give even better advice. Okay. Yeah. Jeff, one more thing. Uh, you're a correctional officer and you've, you've got, you know, the whole, you mentioned the body dysmorphia thing. What helped me at one point was doing uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu because yeah. in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, I actually got to like, you know, fight with other guys and I could see that, you know, size had played somewhat of a role, but my technique played more of a role and it made me feel more confident at smaller sizes and not be so obsessed with being big because yeah. I could I could actually test it, right? And so just one thing to keep in mind, because I know with your job, there's always the threat of physical altercations. Um, so that's just another thing you may want to consider. You could always hang out too with smaller people. That helps. <laughs> Doug hangs out with all little people. That's all his friends. His best friends are all like, you know, 5'1", 180 yeah. pounds. I do. <laughs> And that's the merch. thing. I, and as soon as I see, like, I have four, I have four kids. So me and my wife and four kids are in a picture. I take up half the picture. That's when I'm like, oh wait, <laughs> I am a maybe, big dude. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> Good deal, Jeff. Well, keep us posted. Uh, I, we're Doug's going to throw you in our private forum, so you're in there. Uh, make sure you tag me when you when you post in there. But just keep me posted as you're working through that process. Uh, as far as playing with different diets and foods, like, uh, keep us posted, and then we'll communicate with you in there. Yeah. My, my other question was, I just, um, I've been training for like a good eight years. Well, I, uh, you know, good weight training for eight years. It saved my life completely. I was into some dark places and, uh, and I believe it really pulled me out of that. So I've been training like five to six days a week, really hard. And, um, a lot of volume, a lot of intensity, more, like I said, bodybuilding style training. I just feel like I kind of plateaued, like hit like a stalemate. Um, you know, so, uh, I started running aesthetic, you know, in the last few weeks and I really like it. And I feel that the, 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 um, the focus days help me to beat that anxiety of having to be at the gym five to six days a week. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 So like, I get like, I feel like I have to be there. I gotta be there. I gotta be, I gotta go, I gotta go. And I just can't like, I tried to do anabolic before and I just, I just didn't, didn't really care for the trigger days. I just needed that. Like, Needed to be at the gym. Yeah, yeah, focus sessions are perfect for. I that. mean, that's why yeah. I loved aesthetic, bro. I mean, that was that that program was written and inspired by my com my competing days, and so I I like that too. I like being just being at the gym, you know. But you know, with a guy like you, you you know, you have to the thing where you got to check yourself is is to really learn to listen to your body, and it's okay to go to the gym seven days a week. Just learning to modify the intensity you can't hammer it seven days a week or else your body's gonna is gonna push back and you're gonna be stuck in a hard plateau and I, i've learned this lesson so many times over over decades of training of like i always end up kind of pushing those limits and then i'm always reminded when i peel back a little bit and run a program that is like an anabolic or a maps 15 or something that's way later that i don't like per se doing but then my body all of a sudden responds to it and it's always that reminder of oh i was yep. i was redlining for too long so keep that in mind when you have that tendency that you know your body will probably thank you to pull back on intensity every now and then yeah i, I need to i need that i need to pull back like i did a deload week listening to you guys um finally got me to do a deload week and I appreciate that. Um, but it was hard. It was really, it's really hard for me like to get there and do the 50% intensity, 50% weight, 
you know, and just like, just try to keep everything under control. And, um, I just have a hard time, like not being at the gym, you know, since it, it's such a big part of my life. Yeah. Um, but I think, I think, you know, I think aesthetic works for me. Um, do you guys think that that would be a good program you, for me you know, to continue? Or? I actually think your map's anabolic advance, Sal. Oh, yeah. Where he's having to have like Oh, a, yeah, you would love you anabolic know, advance. I, I think if anabolic advanced, you would actually that's really really like. Cool. And, it, and it programs the deload that's a That's a six-day-a-week program. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's a six-day-a-week, okay. and it programs deloading in there. So I actually think that you would love oh, it. Yeah, so you'll, you'll like it. We'll have Doug send that to you also. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, check that out. But I do think aesthetic is cool too. So, I mean, if you're in the middle of aesthetic, maybe finish it and then go to anabolic advance. But I think anabolic advance, you're going to really like. I think it'd be really good for you. Okay, cool. Right on. All right, thanks, Jeff. Appreciate that. Thanks. All right, brother. You got it. Yeah, sometimes when people hear uh, body dysmorphia, but not the common, like, you know, I'm too fat, I need to lose weight, and they see it like a dude that's like jacked or whatever, he's like, I'm not yeah, big enough. They don't believe you. Yeah, not only do not believe it, that just, just, you know, I've heard people say it's silly, you know, yeah. but body dysmorphia like is trivial. body dysmorphia, and it's yeah. literally, you cannot be, well, nobody's objective when they're, you know, looking at themselves, but boy, are you far from objective. You, and, I, you know what? Mm-hmm. I would make the case, and this is, you know, if you were an outside uh, person that's like a therapist that's into health and everything, then and you have you're not in the this sphere at all, you'd probably say that a good percentage, if not most, all people that are hammering those weights and got big boulder shoulders and the arm like all have oh yeah because that that is not a reflection of like true true health no. We all we all aspire to look that, and we when we highlight it on magazines, and yeah. we and we we praise these bodies that look like that, but it's not a shining example of health. No. And most people that train and diet so hard to look that way have a bit of an obsession that way. Now I would say more than a bit. Yeah, yeah. and I, and I would say now, granted, it, you know, if you're going to be addicted to something, you're going to be obsessed about something. It's probably one of the best <laughs> decisions, you know. But the truth is there's definitely a little bit of body dysmorphia in all of us to, you know, be going to the gym that much that often to keep pursuing better shoulders, better legs. I mean, yep. we're, I mean, we're all already at that healthy point. And if anything, we probably need more of recuperative. No, I make no qualm. I mean, in fact, I think, I don't remember where I said this. I think I said this on another podcast where I said, you know, they asked me about my workouts and I, I gave the disclaimer, like here, quick disclaimer, uh, I trade performance, I trade strength, I trade muscle building for longevity. So the way I work out is not pro necessarily longevity and health. I consider that, but if I'm being quite honest, uh, that's not the thing that I chase most often. And it's always a trade-off. And, you know, it's, you just, I, I've kind of accepted it and working through it. And, you know, I'm sure I'll get better at it with time, but you're right, Adam. I mean, it's uh, something that I think everyone's dealing with. Here's the beauty, though, of going to the gym and training yourself. You work through it and you eventually start to, if you stick to it long enough, slowly start to figure this out. You really do because it requires work. It's not the same as getting plastic surgery. It's not the same as, you know, taking a drug or whatever. You have to go in and train yourself and work on things. And that is a different process. It builds different relationships. And again, if you stick to it long enough, you really start to figure this out. And it might take you till you're 50 or 60 to do so. Yep. But you will eventually start to figure this out. Our next caller is Lisa from Washington, D.C. Hey, Lisa. How can we help you? Hey. So before I tell you my question, I want to give you guys an audio compliment. And I know you focus hard on your audio anyway, but I have a next level compliment for you <laughs> because I have cochlear implants and podcasts have just never been audible to me. I have to have subtitles or be able to lip read. So I just kind of wrote it off as a medium, but I gave you guys a listen and I can hear you freaking perfectly. Oh, and I wow. don't need a wow. single caption. So I got to bet that with the size of your audience, you've been made podcasts accessible to hard of hearing people that never before could listen. Oh, oh good that's job, amazing. Doug. You just You're made right. Doug's dad. Yes. Doug's been having a hard day today, a real hard day. So you just made his day right now. That's awesome. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What do you got for Uh, us? Okay, my question. So I am a bikini competitor, and I know a lot of your advice, you say it's kind of for gen pop, and you give the caveat that the 1% of crazy bodybuilders out there might not apply to. But with one thing that you say that I think applies across the board 
is that breaking your workout into 15 minute increments benefits everybody, no matter how advanced of a lifter you are. Mm -hmm. So I have, I want to do that. And I currently train about between 60 to 75 minutes on my weightlifting workout. So I want to break it apart. But because I'm competing, I have a big emphasis on how I structure my food for the workouts. And I've been doing simple high carb foods around my workouts and then saving fat and fiber and all the denser stuff for the other meals. And I have my creatine and my pre-workout before the workout. So how would you structure the food if I'm breaking it up into 15 minute increments? And as a secondary thing I've been wondering about there is how much of this carb around workout philosophy is based on giving you energy and recovery versus muscle gain and muscle retention. Because I get that if it's about recovery and energy, you probably don't even need it if you're breaking up your workouts into 15 minutes. So. I love this question. I'm just, I'm, I've been waiting for somebody to ask yeah, this Yeah, this is a fun question yeah, so, right here. Okay, so let's let, let's talk about what actually is important first in this regard. So first off, to clarify, you'll be taking a normal workout, and instead of doing it in one shot, you'll be doing several workouts in the same day where the workout's broken up, correct? Okay. So let's talk about what's actually important. Uh, which would be the pre-workout. This is where it, this question starts to make sense is what do I do with my pre-workout if I'm going to work out three times a day and I take a pre, I can't take three pre-workouts. I'd be an insane amount of caffeine or whatever. My answer to that is you don't take a pre-workout or you just take it for the first one and the rest of them, there are, there is no pre-workout. So there's really no way around that unless you want to break up your pre-workout dose, in which case you might be taking the caffeine too late in the day, which might influence your sleep. You won't need it though. You've already expressed this out many times. Like yeah. you'll, when you, what you notice about short workouts is you get energized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what's kind of cool about the short workouts is you don't have that same kind of fatigue feeling that you get when you do a 75 minute workout yeah. where you start to drop off. That's what I did. I, I would take the pre-workout in the morning and then the rest of the day I would just, you know, minus the pre-workout creatine doesn't matter. Just take a post one of the workouts. That's also splitting hairs. Doesn't make a big difference. Now, nutrition, nutrition with the carbs and, you know, when I kind of cycle in or put in my, my energy intake with my workouts, that only matters when you're doing really long, really grueling workouts. And the data is pretty clear on this. It actually makes no difference with, it actually makes no difference with most, most strength training workouts. Uh, now it makes a difference with like hard endurance stamina type workouts that are long, but even most strength workouts, traditional strength workouts, it actually doesn't make that big of a difference, let alone three short workouts. So what I would say is the only thing to consider is you don't want to eat necessarily right before your workout because then you have a full stomach while you're doing the workout. But aside from that, the rest of the day doesn't matter. You don't need to eat post-workout. You don't need to have carbs during your workout. It makes zero difference if you have, you know, have the carbohydrates after or if you have it two hours later. It makes zero difference. Now, the, the what would dictate when or how I eat would be how far apart these are spread out, right? So let's say, uh, so let's say we're going to do it in three segments. They're each going to be about 25 minutes or 30 minutes long, right? If I'm doing my math, right? About 30, 25, 35 minutes long. If you have, uh, four hours in between the first one and the second one, you definitely, I would try and eat right in the middle of that, right? So my, I, I get refueled. I get a good hour to two hour digestion before I get into that next, next workout. I think that's about the only thing that I would probably try and somewhat time. Like I would try and avoid eating like a big meal, like right before I go back into another 15. Al it. Although like Sal's point, it's probably not going to affect that much. So you could kind of play with this. You could see, you could eat your total normal eating schedule and just stay on it and then just schedule your workouts how they fall. You'll probably feel fine, have no issues. But if you notice like, oh, wow, one of my workouts landed right after a big meal and I felt a little lethargic getting into my workout, then then push the meal back a little bit or skip the meal completely before the workout and get it post-workout. So you're as far as the timing with what you're doing, it is not going to affect or hinder gains whatsoever. Yeah, I, it, I, it really is going to come off a of personal preference on how you how you like to eat during these these little broken up workouts. Yeah, the way I would do it is let's say if I did three 20 to 25 minute workouts is I would do the first one before breakfast, the second one before lunch, and the third one before dinner. That's how I would do it. Just because I, I would work, I would feel better that way than doing it right after breakfast, lunch, and dinner. 
Uh, thank you. I will do that. And is there any rhyme or reason at all to doing like more of the compound movements at certain times or just whatever my personal Ooh. preference is? Uh, so you may find, now here's what you, there's two things you can do. You can take your normal workout and just divide it into three workouts. So wherever it falls, it falls. So you do your first workout and then you see, oh, I finished these exercises. Here's the next set of exercises for the second workout. And then here's the next set of exercises for the third workout. That's totally fine. But here's what's probably going to happen. You're going to notice you're going to feel stronger. Mm -hmm. You're going to feel more recovered. And those, you know how it is with your 75 minute workouts. The exercises at the end are the easier single joint finish, you know, finisher type exercises. You may find that because you feel so good, you're, you know, you're going to be like, I actually want to do more compound lifts. Yeah. So you could play around with this a little bit, but you can also just break up the workout that you normally do, which would be totally fine. I mean, I would, okay. I would personally put my compound lifts at the time that you've probably, since you've been lifting for a while already, that you have figured out is your favorite lift. For example, if I was doing the breakfast workout, the lunch workout, and the dinner workout is how I was going to split my routine. I know my body already well enough that I'm going to perform my compound lifts best at the second workout than mm -hmm. I would the first workout Same. because I'm not a good morning lifter. I just, it, I'm, it, I'm like Justin and I both take until noon to wake up. So if I'm coming in and I'm trying to hit heavy squats at six or seven or 8 a.m., it's not going to feel my best. But by noon or one of my second workout, I'm probably going to feel my feel my best. So this is going to be another personal preference. I would suggest playing with it. You know, do one time, try your heavy, hard compound lifts first, see how it feels, then do it second and then do it last yeah, yeah. and then let that drive. Now, here's what I totally. did. Here's what I did that I, I've messed with all of these. Okay. Here's what I did that I got the best results from. Instead of doing the first set of exercises with the first workout and the second one for the second, which is fine. You could do that. Or instead of doing like what Adam said, what I would do is in, let's say I was doing, let's say the total workout was 12 sets. For example, four exercises, three sets each. I would do one set of every exercise, every workout. And oh. I got amazing results with that. So every workout looked the same. I just did one third the volume of every exercise. So it was like, let's say it was, you know, squats, bench, overhead press, row or whatever. I would do that again the second time, that again the third time. I would just do one third the sets the first time, one third the sets the second time, one third the sets the third time. And I got, because of the, the, the frequency of each workout and the way that it stimulated my muscles, I got such great results doing that. Would you then have to warm up and prime for each one, each session? No, I actually found that I did that for the first one and I felt fine the second and third time. I actually, it was one of the strangest feelings is I would jump into the second workout, the third workout. And it's like, I was already primed and warmed up because I had worked out. Yeah, you don't really early. allow yourself to fatigue that way. No. Yeah. So it's like, uh, yeah, you don't really have to consider that as much. So it's like the warm up is, is basically you're just going through it and you're strong to the point where you're not even feeling fatigued. It was, it was really weird. Like I just, I the first workout and I have to do my priming, warming up. Uh, then the second one I'd get in you know, under the bar and I'd be like, Whoa, I feel great. And the third workout. Wow. I feel great. It was really, really interesting. So, but you know, experiment. if you've never trained like this before, give yourself a week or two to kind of like get the, get oh, used at, to it. At least that. And I would yeah, suggest yeah. trying kind of all of our, you yeah. know, let's have Doug put you in our forum. Cause I would love to hear you. This is such a fun question to, and, and the fact that you're a high level type of person who's mm -hmm. been training for a while and at a competitive level, you'd be a fun person to yeah, totally. experiment this it's with. And experiment. I'd love to hear your feedback as you, as you try all of them out, what you're noticing. This is cool. Okay. I'd love to give it to you. All right. You got it. <laughs> Thanks for the compliment, by the way. I appreciate that. Thank you. You got it, Lisa. Bye. Bye. Most people don't can't do this, right? Right, right. Just, this is yeah, not normal. That's no, why it's not a novel, normal question. But sure. dude, I, you know, it was re it's a, it's the weirdest strange. So you had you had better you had better Yes. Uh, that's interesting. It was really weird. Remember I told you guys I, yeah, I would even I, that. I would even do it more than 3 times in a day. I would do like um, Yeah, you do like 5 or 6 a few or sets that. every other hour. Yeah. But but it was like the same exercises each time and it's really strange how your body adapt. Actually you get stronger as the day goes on. It's yeah. going to take a very unique person to i think uh have that same experience as you because you have a, a probably a, a better ability to get right in the groove of something mm -hmm. where one of the perks of you know separating exercises by the workout is you get three sets yeah you to, to kind of get in the groove mm -hmm. 
where you are you're saying basically by the second exercise you're able to get under that barbell squat and it's like you're you're, you're I didn't you're, expect you're, it. Your really one weird. set is a working set. Already. It's really right. weird. Yeah, it is very very strange. Like literally, if someone's listening right now, you could do you know three sets of squats three times a day in the day. And watch how you feel with the second and third workout. And there's actually studies that show that priming and warming up, like the effects of it last for like two or three hours. It's mm -hmm. not like it has to happen right before there's some effects that linger for a little while. So it weird. makes sense. But I mean, my tendency would be to just what Adam said, because it's like the morning I'm like, I just want to like kind of sure. put in the work, but then like around noon or like one o'clock is where I for sure feel my strongest. And I would be more inclined to, to lift heavy and do my compound. So, so when I have done this, I've, I've done a, a, not a formal way of doing this. Like, so I have done like this, mobility esque functional type exercises early oh, when I, I don't need a lot of strength and I'm really kind of it's yeah. like almost like I'm priming the body and I'm kind of waking it all up and I'm getting a little yeah. bit of a pump yeah. but not really training hard and then the second workout is the one where I'm like okay this is where I'm going to load this is the one where I'm going to try mm -hmm. and you know hit my deadlift or my squat or like a big compound lift and that's because I know I know that I need to have a meal or two at least in me for me to really feel a good workout. What's what was most strange about experimenting with this was at the end of the day I had done so much volume that normally have I had I done that much volume in one workout I would have felt like I overdid it. Mm -hmm. But by the end of the day I felt far from overdoing it. I was like, wow, I feel like yeah, like trippy. and the next day I felt pretty damn good. Um, and I had strength gains almost immediately with like two or three days later. You know, th this is also uh, what I really like about this conversation is how unique and different all of us are. Yeah. And you could do a study to try and prove someone's point is more effective here. Yeah. Like, and, and this is just an example of, uh, our space and what we do and why people should caution people to like, take yeah. uh, a study and go like, Oh, this is the best way to do it because well, what if you just respond different to, you know, food timing or, and you will, yeah, and you will yeah. right. And, yeah. and, and all that stuff matters. This is why it's good to take that, like take information that, that we get from good research and use it as a baseline, but to not be afraid to kind of venture out a little bit of that and experiment with it with yourself, because what we might find, she may have a whole different, <laughs> you know, way of, yeah, of her breaking. protocol may look completely different. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Maybe she does all the crazy heavy stuff at the beginning and then she tapers off or mm -hmm. she's maybe she waits all the way to the end of the night. Yeah. The end of the night. Well, yeah, she's yeah. the right person because she's a competitor. So she's yeah. been yeah, she's probably. measuring, exactly. tracking. So yeah, it'd be a good exactly. person. Look, if you like Mind Pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our free guides and information that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on Instagram. Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. I'm at Mind Pump Stefano, and Adam is at Mind Pump Adam. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 